Destiny has brought together the double dragons. Guard them as I guarded you. We don't really have to wear these, do we? Oh man, these are great. Can't buy suits like this off the rack. Of course, I don't have to wear the blue one. What's wrong with the blue one? Welcome to Arcade Attack. A retro gaming podcast for up to four players. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. No matter what time you listen to this, uh, this is Arcade Attack. Uh, I'm your host for today, Rob. And I'm with Adrian. Yo, I'm here. And Dildano, Dylan. I hope you guys aren't in the same house. I hope you guys are social distancing. <laughs> yep. <laughs> like, uh, we're, we're like the triple dragons. See us on today. screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, triple dragons in the in the house on screen. Yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, there's a question. Like I called you Dildano. Guess what? Do you know what film I happened to watch last night? Uh, did you happen to watch um, Double Dragon the movie? <laughs> no, I watched that like. Uh, three or four days ago. I've made a lot of notes about that. No, Barbarella. Oh. Barbarella has a character called Dildano. And also Duran Duran. Correct. Although I think he's actually called Durant Durant in the film. Oh, no. The, the <laughs> band got it wrong. Is that what you're telling me? Maybe. Anyway, I don't you know. Maybe they got it yeah. right. <laughs> Barbarella. Lovely. It's, it's a fun film. But we're not here to talk about Barbarella today. We're here to talk about the film version of Double Dragon. Are you sure we can't talk about Barbarella? <laughs> We can if you want. I mean, it's obviously fresher in my mind than it is in either of yours. Well, Rob, talk about movies really quickly. I went, it, people are going to shout at me now, but I have never seen Godfather before up until recently. So I thought to myself, because we're sort of in lockdown, I'm going to treat myself. So I ordered the box set. So I watched The Godfather, number part one. Number part one, of course. That's what it's called. Then I watched Double Dragon. Then I watched Godfather part two. So I've treated myself to three films. <laughs> Two of which won, like, Best Film Oscars. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Double Dragon won loads of Oscars, didn't it? <laughs> it, it got robbed, I tell you. <laughs> Double Dragon is more of a cult underground film. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Underground. <laughs> but, uh, Could you imagine Al Pacino in Double Dragon, though? That would have been great. <laughs> it would have used up uh, all, I don't know, 1994 Al Pacino? Their budget. Yeah, it would have used up all of their budget. I think by that point, Pacino was already into his hoo-ha stage that yeah. he's still in 25 years or so later. But Love that. I, dig- I digress. Uh, let's talk about Double Dragon the film. But we can't really talk about Double Dragon the film without talking about Double Dragon the game. Mm. Now, we kind of talked, we mentioned Double Dragon in an earlier episode. I was trying to remember which one it was. I think it was either Golden Axe or Simpsons arcade game. It's so one like the beat 'em up uh, podcast we did. I want to say it was a Simpsons arcade one where we talked. About yeah, them. quite possibly. Like so, uh, but you know, Double Dragon. Double Dragon Revolution. is like the kind of the mm. the god, not the god, <laughs> the kind of the <laughs> the original scrolly beat 'em up, isn't it? It's the original yeah, du- scrolly beat 'em up. No, maybe not the original. I think like Kung Fu, oh, the Kung game, Fu. Kind of yeah, and then but was the yeah. first one. But Double Dragon was revolutionary. I think we kind of talked about this before. Mm. Brings like a lot of kind of elements into like the kind of genre that wasn't there before. Like you can go up and down on screen. Like as in addition to left and right, you can play two player, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, came out in 1987. The arcade. Basic plot of the game is Billy and Jimmy Lee are twins who are also ninjas. And they have to rescue Billy Lee's girlfriend, Marion, after she gets kidna- mm-hmm. kidnapped by a gang called the Black Warriors. Mm-hmm. Uh, hugely successful in the arcades and on 8-bit systems. Yep. Mm-hmm. Two arcade sequels in 1988 and 1990 and countless spin-offs on like other kind of home systems. Mm-hmm. Yep. Is it any good? What, mm. Double Dragon as a game or the various iterations of it? Or <laughs> what are we talking? Double Dragon as a game. It's really... <laughs> It's one of these games that's really important in everything, kind of, you know, the, the conception of gaming. And yeah, you're, you're right. Maybe Kung Fu was the first one where you sort of like, you walked along a bit and then kicked someone and then punched someone. But, you know, Double Dragon kind of, it gave you the depth of the stage and you kind of, you had that, co- you know, that co-op kind of thing. And it was the first, definitely the first popular 
game of that genre. So it's mm. very important. I played, I reviewed the NES version a few years ago. Uh, and I really liked it. It's really mm. limited. Um, the, the NES couldn't handle more than three spite, sprites on the screen. So it, you can't have two player. Uh, there's only two bad guys on at a time and, you know, things like, it's still a fun game. Apparently the Master System version is better, but mm. haven't played it. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's good in that respect. The arcade, uh, the arcade game's still fun on MAME and stuff. You know, you can still get your retro pie out and you yeah. can still play that. So, but it had, bad ports uh i think the mega drive port is considered one of the worst uh please for the love of god don't play double dragon 3 me and keith did a walkthrough it's on the youtube channel somewhere but we did a walkthrough of it and it got it got something like it got like 15 percent 20 percent in the in the magazines when it came out and i couldn't believe that a game could be that bad (laughs) <laughs> and it was horrific. It's one of the worst. It's so disjointed. Nothing works. Collision detection awful. Everything terrible. So it's not a franchise that's been looked well, um, you know, looked mm. after well over the years. And things like Final Fight, Streets of Rage, all usurped it afterwards. So that's my kind of my, my whiz through of Double Dragon. <laughs> oh, and Adrian's got the cool fighting Double Dragon, haven't you, Aid? Double Dragon 5, yeah, on the Jaguar. It's, um, uh, you know me, I defend the Jaguars of the kilt or the hilt or the kilted God, hilt. That game is terrible. But wasn't but Rob, it's... wasn't Rob really good at it? Am I really am I, am I remembering this right? <laughs> he was very good at it. Yeah. I oh. do not even remember playing that game. There <laughs> were like, uh, I think it's also a good time to plug Adrian's regular video series, which I guess is just finished. So maybe it's not a good idea. To, it's a good time <laughs> to plug it. But... Go and watch it all. <laughs> yeah. Adrian and uh, his yeah his son like kind of go be... to the. The exit of <laughs> Jaguar. I didn't know you were. I thought, are you watching them? Uh, are you watching them, Rob? Yeah? I watched some of them. Yeah. Oh, cool. Nice. Um, Rocking the youth. Yeah. I watched. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We we done a series of going from my A to Z games, and uh, we've obviously covered Double Dragon. <laughs> yeah. We're on to the Jaguar CD games now. If you're interested, boom. There you go. Nice. But uh, yeah, I, I've got to kind of basically agree with everything Dill said. It's one of those games that I think is much more influential than it is good. Mm. Uh, kind of. You know, obviously revolutionary when it came out, but two years later you have Final Fight, Golden Axe, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and man, just I think Double Dragon has never really recovered from that as a game. Double Having said that, everyone stole its ideas though. If you look mm. like the kind of melee combat, and you know, everyone stole ideas off Double Dragon mm. and just made better games. That's basically what's happened with it. But, yeah. yeah, but again, like usually influential. I think like you know Lonnie Donegan. Uh, kind of, you know, Skiffle Artist was big in Britain, like not really big anywhere else, but hugely successful, on the, so hugely influential mm. on the Beatles and like lots of those other kind of like early British rock and rollers. But mm. man, you don't want to listen to Lonnie Donegan in this day and age. <laughs> <laughs> but you might, yeah. you, we need influencers and I think we need Double Dragon. I suppose, what, you know, when, when, did the, when was the movie made? Was it made just after the, the NES version came out or the arcade version? Uh, well, we're actually going to get into that oh. right now. Right, cool. uh, Double Dragon did come out in 1987. I believe like the NES version came out a year or two later. Mm. The rights to the movie were bought by a company called Imperial Entertainment Group in 1991. Mm. Sound uh, investment. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like this was kind of it a point been. where yeah. there hadn't really been any like uh, kind of <coughs> movies based on video games at this point. <laughs> So it was kind of a bit of a crapshoot. Adrian, like, mute your mic. <laughs> Sorry, I'm got- <laughs> coughing. <laughs> Sorry, guys. There's not a lot on the internet about Imperial, but according to IMDb, they're involved in financing and branding films. They've worked in a few films. Some of their best known films, which they've kind of provided production financing, include the inexplicably popular adaptation of American Psycho. Ooh. Uh, Boondock Saints. If any of you have seen that? No. It's like kind of a really bonkers version of Lockstock, but like with Bostonian Irish Americans. Okay. Uh, like a big cult film, but I don't think it's really that good. And The Pledge, like a Sean Penn film he directed with Jack Nicholson in. Sean Penn, uh, Also involved with a host of absolute and utter turkeys, the most famous of which are Battlefield Earth. No, they oh, didn't. Yeah. Oh, that film's horrendous. And the way it kind of cuts between scenes and the whole thing is horrendous. <laughs> And uh, the remake of Get Carter, which I'm sure Adrian has seen. Stallone, yeah, he's. Um, yeah. Oh, I haven't seen it actually. I want to watch it. I've heard it's. It's actually apparently it's got a few good scenes in there, but mainly rubbish. 
I mean, the, the original of Get Carter, if you haven't seen that, is fantastic. Like, if you haven't seen that, I recommend watching it as soon as you possibly can. The uh, remake looks worse than the remake of The Italian Job, another Michael Caine film. <laughs> mm. oh, yeah. And, yeah, that looks bad. I don't even want to watch that. Yeah, but it's got Stallone in it, so, you know, he can carry it. <laughs> anyway, uh, the film came out in 1994. It was a debut film for uh, director James Yukich. I'd actually never heard of him before doing the research for this, but he was one of the most prolific music video directors of the mid-80s to mid-90s. Worked with a uh, kind of a few very successful artists, but he was Ooh, never on I, the... Si- yeah? Can I have a uh, guess of one of them? Because there's, there's a little, maybe a hint well, in the uh, film. I will kind of get onto that in a sec, but oh, I was okay. going to say... Uh, he was never on the same level as like the people like Steve Barron or David Fincher or Herb Ritz, who are like kind of the ma- absolute like kind of massive kind of music video directors of that kind of era. Steve Barron doing obviously Take on Me, Money for Nothing, and Billie mm-hmm. Jean. Yeah. David Fincher before he went to films like hugely like was the biggest film, music video director like in the entire world for a year or two. Um, you'd have like definitely seen s- some of his videos. Uh, anyway, like, uh, but y- I was going to go into what stuff James Yukich had done. What were you going to say, Age? Well, no, there's a couple of songs or artists mentioned in Double Dragon. Bit of a spoiler, but maybe um, Madonna. I know Madonna was mentioned actually in the film. No, uh, Fincher was actually like the uh, worked quite extensively extensively with Madonna. He did like okay. Vogue and Express Yourself, but no, uh, not Madonna. Okay, and I'm kind of ruining the right end of the film here, but. The farm, I think. We had, we had a song at the end of the film, bizarrely. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't think he did uh, the video for that either. Like, um, he was the director of choice for Phil Collins and Genesis, oh. which Ooh. basically, yeah, not oh. very good, basically. But, but you know, those videos include "I Can't Dance," which was a bit forgotten now, but it was a great video and like incredibly popular on MTV in the I early nineties. I can't walk and I can't dance. Yeah, that kind of thing. And uh, he can like a, sing. Adrian can sing. It was kind of like a spoof version of a ZZ Top video, but it was good. And also, Land of Confusion, the one with the spinning image puppets. Yep, yep. Oh yeah. Uh, I did a couple of for Iron Maiden, which I would only mention because I thought Keith was going to be on here. <laughs> <laughs> He's still kidnapped. He's, <laughs> yeah, he, but uh, he couldn't bring himself to watch Double Dragon the movie. He just just couldn't do it. He was like, I, I can, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to my, build. I'm going to build Anfield instead. That's what he's doing. So, yeah. <laughs> my two favorite Jim Yukish films are sorry, not films, music videos. Are uh, number one, Voices That Care, the terrible pro golf war charity single that came out in the early nineties. Had about twenty famous pop stars and vocals, mm. and literally dozens of famous celebrities on backing vocals, and still couldn't make the top ten either what? here or in the US. Wow! And like these are proper famous. There are at least two like. Probably, I would say, permanent A-list celebrities, like in the main kind of uh, music lineup, like Celine Dion, Will Smith, and mm. like proper, like loads of like proper A-level actors in like the so-called chorus, and like, but yeah, awful, awful song, but worth checking out as kind of a curiosity piece, and also Librarian Girl, the like the Michael Jackson oh. single, had the cursed video, mm-hmm. yes. uh, which he directed. Uh, can you remind us of the video age? Isn't it? Am I getting confused by a few? Is it when they, all the film stars in, in the video? Uh, yeah, kind of. There's about 35 famous celebrities like in the video, and like they're all kind of hanging around the set, and they're all kind of gathering around, and they go, "I, but yeah. I thought I was starring in Michael's video." That's right. <laughs> and then like my favorite, Rob, my favorite person in that video is Carl Weathers. He's in it. Carl Weathers. I knew you were going to mention it. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but then it turns out that like the director is Michael Jackson. He was filming them all. Like all along. I mean, but the all... song's rubbish, but actually, I think it's quite a clever video. Actually, did he direct that then? Uh, oh. Yeah, he directed that video. It wasn't actually Michael Jackson. He just turned Ooh, up at the end and directed his chair. But uh, basically, almost everyone in the video would see their careers disintegrate in the next five years. It's Steve Guttenberg Ouch. was in it. <laughs> it was the yeah, like, example. It's probably like 80 celebrities, like Steve Guttenberg, um, who else in that? Like Dan Aykroyd. There's various models and TV actors who just would never hear of again, like kind of oh. low-level pop stars. I think maybe Debbie Gibson is in it. Oh. The only like the only people who said like big-level careers in the next, I guess, like a few years after this was John Travolta because Stallone, so not Stallone, Tarantino pretty much rescued him, mm. and Steven Spielberg is in there for like three seconds and <laughs> he's still there. And I guess maybe Weird Al, Weird Al Yankovic kind of counts, but yeah. Wow. We'll let Carl Webb slip through as well, just about. Yeah, and uh, 
But like he also did a TV movie called The Return of Bruno, something which has been completely <laughs> forgotten about since then. But it was basically like a, at the time, really successful kind of ego trip movie for Bruce Willis mm. before he like went into Hollywood properly. He was like in the TV show Moonlighting and kind yeah, of yeah. some really successful ads. And that was like, it was kind of the conceit was that Bruce Willis was a fictional 60s pop star. So they had like talking head interviews with actual like 60s pop stars. And uh, it was based around that. Like no one at our age has seen it basically. But mm. Uh, yeah, the, like, uh, this was basically his experience before he came on to Double Dragon. The only feature film he directed after Double Dragon was a film called Affair to Remember, spelt A space F-A-R-E, which a high-powered executive <laughs> takes a Christmas taxi ride with um, a cab driver played by Malcolm Jamal Warner. Oh, no, okay. Malcolm Jamal Warner. <laughs> Who was, Dylan? Um, he's in The Cosby Show. He's um, <laughs> yes, Theo, isn't he, in The, in the Cosby Show? Correct. Like, I don't think it, that film actually got a theatrical release. Like, uh, I mean, I've only seen a few of his music videos, but my impression is that he didn't really have the distinctive visual style that maybe a lot of the directors who made the jump into film successfully did. Hmm. And there are a few of them, like David Fincher, we've already mentioned, Spike Jones, Mark Romanek, like uh, Michel Gondry, uh, Michael Bay. It's like a big music Ugh. video director. Hmm. Even McG. Like the guy who did like Charlie's Angels movies oh, yeah. was pretty big, and you know you can say all of those people basically had a distinct visual style. Anton Corbijn as well, like mm. you know, for better or worse, you can tell that kind of stuff when you see it. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Distinctive. Yeah. Uh, getting on to the writing, the story was done by Paul Dini and Neil Schusterman, both best known for kids' TV writing, okay. although uh, yeah, yeah. with very yeah. different pedigrees, like. Yeah. Paul Dini had done work in a lot of animated series, most notably Batman the Animated Series. Yes, yeah, we're all, Good. We're all fans of that, I think. What character is he most famous for creating? Oh, what, from Batman? Yeah. Uh, or comic books in general? Scarecrow? No, I'll give you a clue. Probably one of the three biggest breakout characters in comics over the last 30 years or so. Uh... I- Iron Man? No, like, over the lo- last... People who exist created in the last thirty years and on the Batman cartoon. Oh, uh, Harley have, Quinn. Yes, Harley Quinn. Oh. Harley Quinn. He's oh, well the done. person who created it. Uh, he in nineteen ninety two. He later moved on to lots of comic and TV cartoon writing for DC, who obviously used to be very good at that. Um, Schusterman, like I don't think anywhere was not kind of anywhere near as celebrated on the same level. Mm. But that was like kind of the basic story. A script was by two guys called Michael Davis and Peter Gould. Davis had just written a film called Prehysteria with an exclamation mark. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a kid's film where a boy finds dinosaur eggs that hatch. Uh, that's basically the, like, the kind of the story of the movie. Oh. Uh, and he went on to write and direct a bunch of films. The only one of which you've probably heard of is Shoot 'em Up with mm. Clive Owen and Monica Bellucci. I've heard of it. I haven't seen it. Uh, yeah, like did a load of kind of like he never really had a proper writing job before. Like Peter Gould, sorry, never had a, a proper writing job before Double Dragon, but he went on to be a writer for Breaking Bad, and then actually went That's, on to create Better, Better Call Saul. Yeah, he created Better Call Saul. I've seen his name pop up because I watched. I'm a massive fan, Rob. I was going to say I've heard that name when I watched Double Dragon. I saw the credits. Like, I'm sure, I've seen Peter Gould somewhere. That's incredible. Yeah, like <laughs> Michael Davis, like I say, did direct a bunch of films, but none of them are really that big. They have people that went on to be quite well known later. But like I'd never heard of them. I doubt most of our listeners would. So who really cares, to be honest? Uh, <laughs> Breaking Bad, though. Uh, there was a, write, a polish on the script done by a guy called Mark Brazil. I, again, I'd never heard of him. But he'd written for talk shows, like kind of late night talk shows before this. He was subsequently gone to work for In Living Color, like the sketch show with like the Wayans Brothers and Jim Carrey before he became famous. And Third Rock from the Sun mm. before mm. co-creating that 70s show. Mm. Uh-huh. Like, yeah, there were some kind of talented people working on this film. Just it was pretty near the beginning of their career. Mm. Uh, art director, a woman called Maya Shimoguchi, who had gone to be one of Hollywood's most like celebrated set designers, uh, before going on to be art director for films like Thor, War of the Planet of the Apes, and Le Mans sixty six, as well as the TV show True Detective. Oh, wow! True Detective, I know, man. man pe- these people are pretty <laughs> successful. 
<laughs> yeah. Special effects coordinator. We'll get on to the special effects later on. Mm-hmm. Uh, a guy called <laughs> Mark Pissarro, who'd worked on Die Hard 2 and Demolition Man, <laughs> and went on to be special effects coordinator on a few what? mid-level films and a bunch of TV shows, none of which, to be fair, were well-known for their special effects. Talking stuff like Desperate Housewives, Mindy Project, Blackish. Wow. I guess pretty, yeah, pretty simple oh, stuff. Goodness. Cinematographer was a guy for music videos called Tony Mitchell, but he got injured on the second day of kind of filming. He got replaced by a guy called Gary Kibb, who basically did a lot of late period John Carpenter films. They live most famously, but also, <gasps> yeah. <laughs> but I love that film. <laughs> yeah. Also stuff like Prince of Darkness. Uh, he, at the time, like he'd made this, he just finished uh, Robocop 3. <gasps> well. Yeah. Uh, Yukich told Yukich told Game Informer, who interviewed him, that he didn't think Kib was the right fit for an action movie, which I guess is fair enough. Like a lot of that stuff seems to have more of a horror movie feel. I mean, that is kind of fair. But having said that, we've kind of gone through this, and in my opinion, there are already far too many inexper- inexperienced people in the crew. And I think maybe it was good to kind of have someone who'd actually worked on proper, like high-level films before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd go along. Uh, yeah, anyway, get on to the film itself. Uh, should we kind of go through a run through of the plot? Man, yeah, go on. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> okay, basically, an ancient Chinese king has sacrificed himself to create a magic medallion that ends up splitting in half. So one half of this medallion has power over the body, and the other has power over the soul. This is like uh, kind of done in a, you know, a little kind of intro bit at the beginning. Mm-mm-mm. Opening bit is a really cool kung fu battle in an in like an ancient, what I thought was an ancient village, but it turns out it's actually not an ancient village. It's in present day. Uh, did you recognize anyone in the scene, either of you? Can't remember it. No. Uh, one of the guys was called a guy called Al Leong, who you might know as either Uli in Die Hard. He was the guy who like eats the the, the chocolate wrappers. <laughs> what? Oh, no. You know the bit. You know the scene of, like Die Hard when all like the. <laughs> Or like the um, Gruber, Hans Gruber's gang are getting re- ready, like to take on the SWAT team, oh. and like the guys, like he yeah. sees like the chocolate parts, he starts eating them. You shouldn't eat wrappers. That is bad for your indigestion, Rob. <laughs> okay, he was eating the chocolates inside the wrappers, <laughs> and but he was also Genghis Khan and Bill and Ted. Mm. Oh yeah, well fair play. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I thought this was a still in ancient China, but it turns out like. Uh, the stealthy ninja who gets away with one part of the medallion is actually a blonde American woman. And it's set in the present day. Yeah. Well, I say present day. Actually, it's set in either the past or the future. <laughs> yeah, I've got, <laughs> I've got the think. date, Rob. 2008? Seven. Seven. Yes, Aiden is correct. 2007. Yes, yeah. Quote, unquote, after the quake. Oh, God. After the great flood, isn't it? <laughs> I've got Great flood and great quake. Yeah. Well, I'm guessing much like Japan, it was a tsunami. Like a quake, it was a quake that caused a tsunami. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, the main bad guy is called Koga Shuko. Yes. Played <laughs> by. Oh, I love it by Robert Patrick. The T one thousand. It's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, Robert Patrick, aka the T one thousand and Terminator two. Did he That's do this? Uh, did he do yeah. this? He must have done this before T two, right? No, I think it's after no, it was Terminator. After. Oh, it was three years after Terminator 2. He, uh, in oh, between the God. two films, he'd, he'd starred, actually he'd starred in a few films, but they were all low-budget flops. Oh, man. It's so I, His star wouldn't have been any brighter after T2. He would be like, he should be the pick of the bunch in Hollywood, do you not think? No, I don't think he's, you'd really say, because he didn't cause he really have any charisma in Terminator 2. You wouldn't think <laughs> he was somebody who could really lead a movie. He's not really an actor, to be fair. He is kind of in that... I can see him in a supporting role for like a Hollywood film, but you can never imagine him leading a proper film. Rob, do you know I've seen him in the flesh? Did you meet him? Well, I didn't meet him because I was at Comic Con last year, and you can pay—you have to pay to get your photo of him or whatever, shake his hand. I didn't bother paying, but I just—I was just organizing at him for about ten minutes on the back of the room. I was going, "Look, that's Terminator guy." That's term- That's the T one thousand. He looks older, what? but he's still definitely him. Why are people being nice to him? He's like kills people. Why? Why? <laughs> he's also he's also the bad guy in Double Dragon. Oh, I said, "Oh, you're my favorite actor in Double Dragon." <laughs> <laughs> question: How much was I, he charging? A... Actually, sorry, Rob. What, how much was that's he charging question. to to, um, to, to sign, uh, uh, sign stuff? Ooh, uh, probably about fifty quid, if you want. Like, an, uh, I know. Yeah. I, I I I spent a bit less to get a. a a handshake with uh, Johnny Lawrence from um, Karate Kid. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Money well spent. Money well spent, yeah. How much was yeah. he, about a fiver? 
<laughs> it was about 30 quid, I think, you know. Oh. oh. But it was big. Cobra Kai, man. Cobra Kai. Cobra Kai. Cobra Kai. You must not die. Yeah. <laughs> Sweep the leg. Sweep the leg. As I say, like he, I, he was in a bunch of really low budget flops between in between the, those two films. I really hadn't heard any of those, but he did have a very brief, very memorable guest appearance in a film between those two films. That I know for <gasps> Adrian knows what it is last, for the sound last of it. Hero. No. Oh. Uh, pretty certain it's a film both of you have seen. It's a sequel to a film that came out before Terminator Two. Why don't I remember him being in any other films? <laughs> he was basically playing the T-1000 or a version they didn't really name him but in Wayne's World 2 oh of course he's in Wayne's World 2 isn't he yeah I and uh, him in Wayne's World he is, 2 he is he is although I barely remember Wayne's World 2 so yeah the first one's good the second one's meh yeah. I think the first, second one's very good like it's not quite as good as the first one but still a very funny film there's, there's, high, there's Flash is a genius I'll say that about it if that makes sense Anyway, um, in this film, Robert Patrick is sporting a combo of a bleached blonde crew cut oh, man. and a moustache that looks like the one that was Andy Cairns, the singer from Therapy, was wearing at the same time. Yeah. Do you uh, know what? I think it suits him, Rob. I actually think he looks quite dapper. I was, do you know what? I've actually got written my notes. I actually think he looks pretty cool. Yeah. He shouldn't look cool, but he does in a weird way. Yeah, I think it does work. Dill, what do you think? I think he looks cooler than the name. Kukushuku. <laughs> Yeah, I think, actually think he does a very good job in this film. Yeah, all... I do. I do. I think he steals the scenes when he's on it, actually, to be fair, which is not always a difficult job. But... <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I like him in this film. I, actually, he was watchable, you know? Um... Yeah, I, I think the same. Like, the blonde woman who stole the other half of the amulet is his henchwoman mm. called... She's also in the game. Anyone remember her name? Oh, oh yeah. Oh. Oh, I've forgotten her name, but yeah, she's in the game. Um... Oh, oh, is it... It's not Electra or something, is it? Oh. No, it's something oh. not ridiculous Rebecca is it Rebecca no that's a different person it's something isn't it? normal isn't it what's her name in it um I've got written down Linda Lash but I have a Lin- my yes pick. Linda Lash yeah that's why it's yeah. just like a normal name Linda with the whip but with a lash yeah uh, that's one yeah she has, she needs to work on her delivery because she's yeah. not great in it let's be honest yeah, I like, I kind of had a separate section of the acting, but for me, I think she was the worst actor in the movie. She just Would looked it? completely out of place. I mean, her whip had more film, charisma <laughs> in a film with her. In a film with lots of things out of place, she's probably the most thing, the thing most out of place. But, <laughs> yeah. Mm. Anyway, like she, when she gives him the half the amulet, he uses it to disappear, and he like goes all black and white, as in like a black and white movie. Those are cool special effects, I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I did not think those were good. <laughs> <laughs> this is 94 rob come 94, on 94 mate i thought you know i think i thought that was quite cool i was like if i'd have seen that in the cinema i'd be like oh that's cool mm. Mm. i mean you have to bear in mind this is, came out the same year as the mask and yeah. a good five or six years after who framed roger rabbit and yeah yeah it's nothing compared to those come on <laughs> yeah so uh who holds the other half of the medallion um, oh, the, the um, lady the get- who is the adopted mum of the twins. That's yeah. correct. Uh, she's only it- a little bit older than the twins, isn't she? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Basically, she like went over to some like old kids and were like, "Oh, do you want me to I'll adopt be your mum now? I'll adopt you. You guys need look like you could do with a pizza." Yeah, yeah. Uh, she is uh, their guardian, Chinese woman. Caught is she Chinese Japanese? I, that sounds awful, but like I couldn't. We don't know. We don't, finished, we don't know. I'm going to say Chinese. Uh, yeah. Of course, she's Chinese. What am I talking about? I've got, like, I've literally talk, been talking about the plot being set in ancient China. Anyway, her name is Satori. Mm. And uh, she holds the other half of the amulet. And she's coaching the Lee brothers as they fight each other in the indoor car park dojo. Indoor is car that, park dojo. <sighs> uh. It's like It seems to be like an underground martial arts tournament, but it has, also has corporate sponsors. <laughs> yeah. yeah like, everyone in the crowd is wearing karate clothes. It's really weird. Yeah. Why it's is everyone crazy. in the crowd wearing karate clothes? It's, just... <laughs> it's like it has corporate sponsors, but there's like no spectators there's who no... aren't in the tournament. And <laughs> it's on TV or anything. It's, it's a bit like Wembley, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Prawn Sandwich Brigade. <laughs> it's a bit like Wembley. We just still the corporate sponsors in. Surely the Emirates would be... Sorry, the, the Emirates or the Etihad Ooh. would be... It. Ooh. Okay, let's say the Etihad. <laughs> but yeah, we say the Etihad, that's fine. We don't, we don't have any Man City fans on our, on our, on our panel, <laughs> if we do, but... 
but we do. We Adrian is pretty much, Adrian's always talking about his ass blog, isn't he? So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, sorry, carry on. Yeah, uh, getting on to the twins, uh, Billy and like Billy and Jimmy oh, Lee. God, uh, how do I say this without sounding a little bit? They're not twins. They can't twins. be twins. And yeah. I don't want to sound yes. rude. And I've got to be careful what I say here, but they are not genetically twins. They have different ethnicities. We can say <laughs> this now. Well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm yeah. from an ethnic minority. I can say that they're from different <laughs> ethnicities. It's a bit well, like, it's a bit they like could be me brothers. And, it, yeah. G- G- Jimmy and Billy Lee might as well be played by me and Rob. That's basically, <laughs> that's basically oh, it, I, isn't it? We'll talk about the um, AA remake soon, won't we, Dylan? <laughs> Are we going to do an AA remake? People keep challenging us to do these things, and we'll do it. Yeah. We, we will do it, mate. You know. Well, oh. well, Dylan, I don't see colour, so I Nathan. don't... Nathan. Uh, Nathan. I ah. don't see any difference between oh, you. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Or, yeah. or for that matter, between, between you and me. <laughs> didn't, yeah, we look exactly the same. Didn't 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 Nathan char- challenge us to do an, eight, an arcade attack? remake of double Dragon. he wants to make remake the film and if, he, if he, we can act better that's Nathan, what you know we'll bloody do it just, just, <laughs> you know um i'm i'm sartori uh, okay. adrian can be adrian can be, be a bobo a, no i want to be scott scott wolf actually thanks <laughs> i was just about to ask you who played who played billy and jimmy and yeah the answer is scott wolf oh, and, man, the, and matthew the, fox i would obviously be kokushuko in this but yeah, uh <laughs> yeah Get on to this. Billy is played by Scott Wolf, best known for yeah. Because I was watching my wife, and my, Becca was like, "Oh, that's the guy from Party of Five. And I, what are you on about Party of Five? He's like, "Yeah, I used to watch that." So yeah. sorry, <laughs> Party of Five, like the probably now mostly forgotten mid nineties kind of teen drama show that had not only Scott Wolf, who went on to be in Double Dragon, but also um, Neve Campbell, Campbell in the Scream movies, yeah. and Jennifer Love Hewitt. Who was in lots of stuff in the late nineties, including and like, Matthew you know, Fox. Lost. Matthew Fox who went to be lost. Um, being lost, yeah. Rob, Rob Dylan, how many T V shows or even films have got actors that have both got animals in their surnames that are quite similar? So Wolf and Fox are quite similar, aren't they? I don't know. Yeah, but, that's a good point. But Bojack Horseman really took the took the <laughs> mick out of them both. So basically <laughs> really? I, I can't remember which way it was round, but they had um they had both of them like presenting a, an award or something to Bojack or I can't remember now but either Scott Wolf is a fox and <laughs> Matthew Fox is a really demented wolf or something <laughs> it's just yeah it's it's pretty funny but yeah those guys that, that that is that odd pretty- that is odd how there's a wolf and a fox in part. Do you know party. what though? Scott Wolf, um, I don't know much about his acting ability too much. I've only seen him in Double Dragon really. Uh, and quite- go and go, I've seen him in Go. Yeah, okay, that's a fair point. Go but actually, quick... I think he's quite likable. I think he's not. He's almost like the the kind of Z list uh, Michael J. Fox. So if you can't get Michael J. Fox, you go with Scott Wolf. They're kind of that sort of cheeky chappy. Kind Z of look. list is kind of harsh. It's yeah, it's not Z on the C list. I yeah, think like yeah. obviously none of the none of the cast of Party of Five are really anything much anymore for differing reasons. Some of which we can't probably legally go into on the part. Oh. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh but like um yeah. Uh anyway, but like, you know, I think they all kind of had enough charisma to be big for brief periods. Obviously Scott Wolf went on to be in Go, which did Dylan and me go to see that in the cinema at no, the same time? I I, I think you told me it was good and then yes. I as soon as it came out on video I bought it. But it's mm. funny, like he looks so much younger in Double Dragon than he does in Go and Go was only filmed what three years after no it was uh, five or six years no was five it, years after I think was it 99 Go yeah Go came out uh, really mm, like the same month as um, Human Traffic which is kind of oh, like the okay. British version right, of Go five, yeah five, five years make, will make sense then he just yeah, like, a I mean, bit like when, when I was watching Double Dragon I'm like should he look that young? Like he looks like <laughs> bloody like 16 because he's meant to be 17 in the, in the, mm. in the film isn't he so mm. I'm guessing he probably was 17 or 16 or something like that when he was in Double Dragon. Yeah. Uh, and the the brother, Jimmy, is played by a guy called Mark uh, DeCascos. Uh, he yes, was then a, at that point a complete unknown. But, uh, Dylan, you seem to know who he is. Well, wasn't he like some kind of like martial art dude? Because doesn't, do, doesn't he do his own stunts? Am I getting this completely wrong? With, am I getting this mixed up with something else? 
I'm sure he does his own fighting in the film because he is a proper martial arts guy. That's and it. He's a proper martial arts dude. Mm. I know him from it's... somewhere else, but I can't put my finger on it. But I, his name definitely rings a bell. So he's, well, a, he's a proper like martial arts dude, mm. hence why he can't act that great. To be <laughs> his, his biggest subsequent role came actually last year, like that recently, like 25 years onwards, as mm. Zero in John Wick 3. Oh, uh, there you go. I haven't yep. seen John Wick 3, but I think that's where I kind of know the name from but he was also uh ling and cradle to the grave that's number two cradle to the grave oh, i've seen that yeah yeah kind of Jet Li dmx film that was like mm. a serious version of rush hour there you go. and he, but he also starred like a late 90s tv adaptation of the crow and this is probably uh where you might know him from he played kung lao on the 2013 mortal kombat legacy tv series Boom. Wow. the mortal kombat <laughs> tv series oh, bonus oh, question yeah. I Who knew played? I'd seen him somewhere. I was like, he, <laughs> I knew, I knew, yeah. He's a sort of kung fu guy. I'm like, oh, he's doing his. He's definitely doing his own stunts. Yeah, that's definitely him. And then I just bonus question. Yeah. Go on, Who man. played Johnny Cage in the Mortal Kombat Legacy TV show? Scott Wolf. Uh, no. Oh, uh, oh. You, you two would both definitely know him. I can't remember. He was again biggest in the late nineties. Oh, I can't remember. Incredibly scared, square chin. Square chin nineties actor. Mm. Late nineties. Oh god, you have to give me more of a clue than that, mate. Uh from a, from an incredibly wealthy family. Like one of those Holly like very like there are a few Hollywood actors from like incredibly and by incredibly I mean like Jason Van Der Beek. level. No, uh, Van Der but he does he does have a van in his name. Oh. Casper Van Dien. Oh. Uh. Yeah, Casper Van Dien. Isn't he in um Oh crap! What is he else? Is Starship he in? Troopers. Starship Troopers. Yeah, he's the main dude in Starship Troopers, isn't he? It's a good film, that. And Sleepy Hollow, yeah. Yeah. Oh but, yeah. Yeah. Also, Marco Marco Dacascos was in Wing Commander Four: The Price of Freedom, <laughs> 1995. There's actually. Are oh, you talking about the game? I thought there's only one. One. There's only one Wing Commander film. To be fair. Yeah, the game. <laughs> Starring Freddie Prince Jr. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe leave that there, eh? No, I think that might have been a different game. I think Freddie Prince Jr. was a few years afterwards. Well, no, no. I'm t- Freddie Prince Jr. was in the Wing Commander movie, Rob. Oh, I see. Yeah, that makes more sense. Yeah, I think uh, this Wing Commander game may have been the one that had Mark Hamill in. Mm. But I'm not entirely sure. I think that's free, top man. Okay. Anyway, uh, the roles of the two brothers are quite early. Jimmy is a serious older brother, while Billy is like the younger hothead. If they're twins, I mean, what? Are they talking minutes older? Well, I don't think they actually are twins in this. Yeah. They're twins in the game, but they're yeah, like yeah. Uh, Jimmy is like the older brother, and Billy is the younger brother. Like he seems, to, his character seems very much based on Tom Cruise and Top Gun. Yeah, hothead, a little bit flashy. Not he doesn't does his own things, a bit crazy. Doesn't like yeah, him. like he even looks a little bit like him, kind of like cross between Tom Cruise and um, Daniel uh, out of Karate Kid. Yeah, yeah, I agree actually. Yeah, and like I said, it's got that kind of Michael J. Fox cheeky grin on him, isn't he? Yeah, like they're kind of competing in this uh, kung fu thing in yeah. uh, underground car park, and like he loses the mo- the money because he fools around too much. He does. He does. He does. Simple as that. <laughs> At this point, uh, they cut to a newscast. Uh, the news Ooh. readers are played by, in guest appearances, George Hamilton. In- <laughs> correct. Ultra tan, seventies and eighties TV mainstay George Hamilton. How did he not get skin cancer? And who's I don't. <laughs> The lady's also famous, but I've forgotten her name. We just we got uh, distracted by the weather guy, didn't we? <laughs> well, before oh, yeah. that, I, I, I have to say to Adrian, do you know what film George Hamilton was in? I just thought he was part of the, the Beatles. <laughs> Jokes. <laughs> That's a bad joke. No, I don't know. <laughs> uh, his biggest, his most famous film was probably a film you're going to be watching this weekend. The Godfather 3. Oh, Ooh, spoiler alert. Yeah, as, as mm. you know, I've been, <laughs> what's better, Double Dragon or Godfather 3? That's the question I want to ask. Yeah, like, you were meant to watch it uh, last weekend, but uh, apparently you didn't get around to it, so it's going to be this weekend. It's going to be this weekend, yeah. (laughs) Uh, My favourite George Hamilton role, he was a psychotherapist who uses hypnosis to kill someone in an episode of Columbo. Oh. Yeah. And uh, the woman is played by uh, Vanna White, who's virtually unknown in the UK, but was the co-host of Wheel of Fortune in the US. Okay. Uh, Weatherman is played by Andy Dick, who, uh, like, you might know <laughs> this kind of a Smog comic caster. actor. Yeah, he's a really big video game fan, like, and mm. uh, I believe he's done some Dungeons and Dragons thing. Am I wrong about that? 
I don't know. Adrian's done most of the research on Andy. <sighs> like, I, you know, he is a bit big video game fan. Why haven't we interviewed him for the, <laughs> for the podcast? I don't even think we're allowed to talk about this, are we? This is this is no. Yeah, yeah. This is, it's like this a is... Sonic. It's like Sonic Three Music all over again. Yeah, yeah, this is like um, um, we'll have to just cast this to the sands of time. Maybe we'll tell the story years from now. Um, we'll save it for the Arcade Attack live show. But we have, yeah, we have, we 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 yeah. have we have spoken to Mister Dick actually. So we have we have had that that yeah. honor. So, we have. but the stories we will leave for much another day. Um, just, he, just he's the smallcaster, yeah. and he's in it for what a minute. <laughs> two minutes yeah he's like basically talking about the whole kind of newscast is like pure exposition uh there was an earthquake a few years back and it caused a tsunami which means large parts of like los angeles are still underwater which looks this cool actually. Opposite, actually. Like, i quite mm. i quite like that 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 kind of angle and you see like bits of the town all flooded and it's like a river mm. now and i quite like that i thought yeah it was I, all right <laughs> Yeah, like I kind of have notes further down. I'm going to get into the special effects, but actually, I think that is the best bit of the special effects. Um, mm, anyway, like the, because of that, that means there's insane amounts of smog and black rain, which means people have to wear face masks and hard hats because, like, and there are kind of constant aftershocks. And um, like, I mean, they say this at this point, but I'm pretty sure there are no face masks or hard hats after this scene uh, in the film. Yeah, they don't bother with them afterwards. Lockdown was eased throughout the film, I think, Rob. So everyone's like, you must wear face masks. And then all of a sudden, the government says, it's been eased. Just just be alert. You're right. (laughs) Just just be alert. It turns like there's a curfew after which gangs basically rule the streets at night as part of two with cops. Like, this took place about 18 months after the Rodney King riots in Los Angeles. Like, uh, I don't know how familiar you two both are with those. Not really. Sorry. Basically, like, uh, kind of get into brief kind of history kind of sidebar. This will probably be familiar a lot more to the American listeners. But early 90s, uh, there had been, like, long-standing kind of, uh, kind of conflicts, tension between the LAPD and uh, kind of, like, residents in Los Angeles, especially in black areas. Like, LAPD, very famously heavy-handed mm. at that point. And uh, they were caught on camera, like, basically, some actually, this is before mobile phones, someone, like, caught caught them on camera the camcorder basically about six cops beating the hell out of like this kind of suspect with their truncheons on the ground like this black suspect called rodney king oh that's and the rodney this... king thing isn't it sorry yeah i apologize for my for, for my ignorance yeah, yeah, yeah. it's coming yeah, my, that's, yeah that's a horrible thing to remember isn't it jesus and it, yeah and it kind of got released and uh like all the tr- cops kind of went to court they were like kind of being charged with assault and every single one of them was like uh, the jury can like decide they were innocent, I know, and that kind of joke. kicked off Seriously. kicked off about a week's worth of like extensive riots in Los Angeles. And basically, I think you can really kind of tell that looking at culture around that time, like LA Hollywood culture, it did feel like there was this kind of apocalyptic vibe to the mm. whole thing. Mm. Like the whole kind of like uh, I guess city was going to kind of collapse any time. Yeah. Obviously, this film comes out a couple of years later. You can still really feel like the kind of influence is very fresh oh, in there. Yeah. Yeah. Also, like Demolition Man, another kind of LA-based film that came out not that long Wait, afterwards. Sorry, Rob, for to interrupt. What was? Who was the person that got killed again? Was it Rodney King? Uh, Rodney King. Oh, sorry. Killed. You he always just... hear it, like because people <laughs> use it to make to make points, like oh, another Rodney King thing, or no, because you kind have of have you heard of yeah? And like, there's a film I watched a few years ago called Fruitvale Station uh, yeah, about. Film. Oscar Grant, yeah, and I know it's a different story, but Michael B. Jordan plays. It's a, it's a. I, say it's, it, I mean, I, I can't say it's a great film, but it's a really captivating film. It's really worth watching. Um, have you seen it, Rob? Yeah. Yeah, Ryan Coogler, I think, uh, directed that before. It, did Creed and that's right. Yeah. Black Panther. Yeah, that's right, and it's it's a film I'd recommend watching. It's not easy watching it. I don't. You've not seen it, Dylan? Then no, no, mate. Sorry. Right, it's got it's got me thinking. That, but yes, it makes me really sad when I see stuff like that. But I think it's important. It's just a really to remember. sad thing, isn't it? It's just a sad aspect of life. I think. But yeah. yeah. But but anyway, like you kind of feel it has that like post uh, LA riots vibe. Although interestingly enough, the gangs in the film are probably ninety percent white. Like there are ba- mm-hmm. barely any black characters in the film at all, yep. despite the fact it takes place in LA, which is very racially diverse they really have whitewashed the film a little bit yeah um yeah but maybe right. it was because of that maybe they just didn't want to touch that if this was all going on at the same time i just wonder if they purposely just like that was a that's what something they they decided on and it's not as if the, it's not as if the gangs are that 
are that nasty anyway, aren't they? They're meant to be like, it's a, it's, yeah, it's a kids movie, isn't it? So they can't it, like. The film, that, I mean, there is some dispute over the tone of the film, but the film in general, it feels very PG to me. Like yeah. Billy and Jimmy and Satori are on the way back, driving on the way back, like from this uh, tournament, and they go, "Oh no, it's curfew! It's after dark!" <laughs> and they get ambushed and stopped by a punk gang called the Mohawks, who's <laughs> led by someone in the game called a Bobo. Bo- a Bobo. <laughs> uh, and like it's like the Lees have this computer in their car, which they use to instantly, I mean, by instantly, I mean in like a second look up the gang and get exact stats for a bobo like even his weight it's like a tenth of a kilo it's and very it's... computer gamey i mm-hmm. mean it is ludicrous but it's very kind mm. of computer gamey isn't it it is kind of quite strange but it comes up like the gang come up and like they're basically charged them 50 dollars to leave the car alone 50 bucks like... that's it there you go <laughs> I mean, I say it's PG. They hint later on there are no guns in the city at all as part of the truce, Mm -hmm. which is just, it's so weird. And the gang, like, ask for ID and and say they accept credit cards. So maybe, like, it is an (laughs) official truce. It's it's just, yeah, it's not pieced together the best, is it? Yeah. It's got more more plot holes than a sieve, isn't it? But... (laughs) I mean, the computer effects are prehistoric, but I think like it was definitely the right decision to use an adapted street set for like the film rather than yeah. studio sets for the street scenes. Like, I mean, we we were reviewed Super Mario a while back, and that was very kind of studio heavy in terms and of the sets. Looks, yeah, and it yeah. Lo- you know it's in a studio. That's a problem. Yeah, with that film. like I watched another terrible film recently called Theodore Rex. Mm. Oh, mid nineties yeah. film Whippy Goldberg is like a future cop who. Uh, Why are you watching kind of... bad bad movies, Rob? <laughs> you need to watch good movies. Well, I'm part of like this bad movie group in Melbourne. Or at least I was part of it, and they've got online now, so well, I they can kick watch. You out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no, I moved away. So, <laughs> you like, said to him, "I'm watching Double anyway. Dragon." Rob, you said, "I'm watching Double Dragon." So I said, "That is just too bad. You're out. <laughs> We're not scraping the barrel that much, mate." <laughs> no, like that. I... We watched Theodore. In fact, I ended up watching it twice. Watched Theodore Rex recently, and Whoopi Goldberg is like this future cop who has like a talking dinosaurs a new partner, and it's a thirty-four million dollar film, which didn't even get released in the cinema. But Jesus. like, they also have this really artificial looking big stage sets, and they look awful. But I actually <laughs> thought like this Double Dragon sets for the most part look pretty cool. Yeah, I'd say so. and like the Lee's car looks cool. Like it has this huge like flamethrower and nitro device on top. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, do you not think it looked good? Yeah, it's the um, and but they managed to get away with him because the car they were driving, you could power with rubbish. Do you see that a bit? That Rob? is madness, isn't it? They're putting all the <laughs> rubbish in the car to power it, and Jesus! If only a, a, a futuristic modern film could think of that idea, you know? <laughs> it, lol, I know it's another Back to the Future thing, isn't it? But it's, yeah. um, <laughs> but it it kind of works for the hilarity. Although, why doesn't it burn his arm off? There's at one point his arm is right over the top of it, and it's glowing. Wouldn't it have just burnt his arm off? These are tough guys. Have you not met? Have you not Jimmy met Billy and Jimmy, Jimmy before? Yeah, I mean they they don't seem the, the toughest. I'll be honest <laughs> with you. But, but uh, anyway, like they kind of dry, they're trying to try to get away from them because I think the Mohawks are trying to steal the amulet or the medallion yep. yeah. and the Mohawks chase them in their van and both vehicles crash and they kind of screw up for a fight mm-hmm. and Billy ben- says like hey broomhead we're going to sweep the streets with your skull <laughs> yeah. which I thought was a, a rad line I love that line you, Rob just before that there was a line when, it, when I think it was Billy whoever's driving or Jimmy I think it was, it was driving Jimmy um, and he wasn't doing a particularly good job and he said you must be dude you must suck at video games yeah, no, Meta. That, Meta. No, that was the Mohawks van. Oh, right, the of course it van, was. Like, has a little screen in it. And, yeah. Yeah. And he <laughs> said, doesn't he say game over, ugly? <laughs> yeah. Rob, it's Dylan, it's Meta. Ugly. It's meta. Life ugly. and art, art and life. Yeah, because they're ugly yeah. and motherly. I forgot what he called. <laughs> what's, what's his, what's Homely? his nick, nick, Homely, thank you. <laughs> yeah. No, it was you know, it was something else, but I can't remember what it, it was. It was Homely, you're right. I think it was, okay. ho- was it, ho- I want to say it's Homely. Ugly oh, yeah. and homely. Okay, whatever. They were like, like, yeah, they're about to get beaten up, weren't they, Rob? Yeah, uh, they're about like they kind of all crash and the, like the Mohawks are about to kind of take them, but they get ambushed by what looks like another gang. The Mohawks yeah. went off, and do you know what Billy says <laughs> when they went off? The Mo- <laughs> what, do you know what he says when the Mohawks yeah. went off? Doesn't he say "Last of the Mohicans"? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which, like at that point, that time would have been a fairly recent reference, but yeah. you know. But no, actually, like it would have been a re. It was actually kind of date, dated even then. I mean, it was kind of like two years dated at that point, so fairly recent. But the film was set in two thousand seven. 
<laughs> so like, it would be massively dated. It's I like, liked it, Rob. I liked it. They're meant to be teenagers. They would not know. Funny. Yeah. I mean, like, I'm, Adrian, I'm pretty sure at least one of your kids was old enough to have been, like, about 15 in 2000. No, no, they wouldn't be 15 in 2007. That would be ridiculous. But, like, that that would just be, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it would be dumb, wouldn't it? Let's be honest. Yeah. Anyway, it turns out the gang, not this new gang, are actually not a gang, but they're a street community group, I guess. Mm. Do you know what they co- Do you remember what they're called? I just call them the camouflage gang because <laughs> they kind of turn. Cool. There's something cool. They, in the... They call the power core. Power core. And they wear it. they wear tie dyed overalls, and I'm going to be honest, look soft as hell. <laughs> <laughs> it's all a deception that they want you to think they're soft. Then bam, they're a, a bit right like they're a bit like a like like a gang like a gang who just dance or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they just yeah that's. Good. I loved it how they were kind of camouflaged in the walls and they turned around like they're badasses. That was <laughs> yeah, the best. I yeah, because their outfit is the, is the graffiti <laughs> and they turn around and that's their thing. And like Alyssa Milano, you're like, oh, Alyssa, what are you doing? Love? Oh, bless her. Yeah, Alyssa Milano plays the leader of the gang called... Marion. Yes, Marion. Yeah. Like the, she's not actually been kidnapped in this film. Yeah. Uh, no, nor, but, is like... she, nor is she at the beginning a love interest of either of the... Lee brothers. No, so like this is a very young Alyssa Milano. What was she best known for at this point in 1994? <laughs> yes, Commando. Chenny. <laughs> Chenny. <laughs> yes, well, actually, no, she was not. That was so obviously the role she'll always be known for, but no, she was not best known for that. She was, she was uh, best some, known. For... She was in some series, wasn't she? I forgot what it was. She, she was Samantha and Who's the Boss? Who's the Boss? <laughs> like eight years, the car, like the sitcom with Tony Danza uh. in uh, the lead role. Uh, she would go on to Melrose Place in the late 90s, Charmed shortly afterwards. And, mm, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what I was watching with Becca. She was like, oh, that, he's, in, <laughs> he's in Party of Five. She's in Charmed. I'm like, what are you, what are you on about? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, uh, I think most recently I spent seven years of hosting Project One Way All Stars, which I'm sure all of us are deeply eh? familiar with. I bought the box set, mate. I watched it religiously. <laughs> <laughs> what? Eh? What is it? It's a spin-off of Project Runway, which uh, I think that? is some modelling reality show. Oh, golden bit. Well, whatever floats your boat, I suppose. Yeah. So what do we think of as of Alyssa Milano as Marion in this film? She's All I right. know is I think you see her bottom more than her face. <laughs> I thought she was hot as fuck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She oh, was cute. We didn't, oh, we didn't apologise for the swearsies. No, we don't, but we apologise for the swears. Um, but yeah, it, she, yeah, she's pretty hot in it. Her, I mean, her... Yeah, go on. I don't. I don't know if the. I don't know if Adrian's comment was quite correct. I mean, yeah, there's a certain certain scenes um, where that might ring true. But I think you. We'll see, get on to that. I think you see her face more. No, I'm only joking. I'm tongue <laughs> tongue in cheek. But yeah, like she generally, uh, she has this really awesome uh, kind of bleach blonde mm. crop in the. Ah, oh, it still looked amazing. Here's his question: Which film that came out the following year completely ripped off her look? I know, she, much... yeah, because th- I was thinking, oh, hang on, that looks familiar. Uh, it, oh. 95. Oh. Okay. Two different characters. She's basically looks like a, a cross between Dade Murphy, a.k.a. Zero Cool, and Kate Libby, a.k.a. Acid Burn in Hackers. Hackers, oh. yes. She looks like the Hackers characters. She looks basically like a cross between the two of them yep. in this film. Yeah, I go along with that. And, uh, but it suits anyway, her. But, I think it does suit yeah. her. Yeah, it does suit her, yeah. She's, she's very pretty. She's very attractive. I think she looks gorgeous in this, and she is kind of cool. Anyway, Billy flirts with her for a bit, and uh, then like they get the brothers go home, and it cuts to Obobo telling like Kogashuko <laughs> oh, about bro. this whole kind of thing. And like they plop the computer info on the brothers. Like I don't know, it feels like everyone has a computer file on them in the future. Mm. Yeah, well, you know, track and trace. That's 2007, mate. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, Shuko is, is really angry that they didn't get the medallion, so he forces like a bobo into some weird steroid machine that makes him into like a super strong mutant. Ugh. Oh god! Which, man. And it's... some of the worst, some of the worst prosthetics that I've ever seen. Yeah, it feels like a, a really hackneyed hop plot point at this point. Like we did Super Mario Brothers; it's part of that film. Mm-hmm. But also Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Two: yeah. Secret of the Ooze, yeah, with Shredder and Batman and Robin with Bane. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah, it was a bit so, unnecessary. And, and it says it makes you ten times stronger, Rob the Machine. Yeah. I don't know, ten, <laughs> ten times seems exaggerated. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, 
at this point, we cut to another newscast saying, and at time of broadcast, this is hilarious. I say, I don't know what's going to happen, but between this being recorded and going up, but right now it's hilarious. They say, like, Madonna has decided she's going to do a Greta Garbo and basically retreat from the public eye. Oh, if only. Mm-hmm. She's, we're meant to be in quarantine. She still can't, off, can't keep off social media and make an <laughs> exhibition of herself. <laughs> oh, I, I don't want to offend any listeners now. I'm sure there's some fans of Madonna. I just can't stand the women. I'm sorry. Uh, some I'm a people. Fan of Madonna. Ugh, I'm I a just fan of Madonna. <laughs> she, I find her annoying. I find her personality grating. I find her, most of her songs ridiculous. Just over the overrated. I don't know if I'd go, I don't, I'd go for a pint with her now. I might have gone for a pint with her in the eighties, maybe early nineties. I wouldn't have done. So when now. I read that headline, did and Madonna wants to be alone? I was like, bring it on, make that happen. <laughs> Leave us to it. Buzz off. <laughs> Buzz I gotta off. say, uh, and this is a very brief side point, but. I'm definitely a fan of Madonna. I think her Eddie's 90s output is fantastic. Mm. Her 2000s output's all right. It's a little bit more patchy, but I think like she was really sound back then as well. She seems to have just been famous too long. I think this happens to people. They become, mm. they get famous for too long and they kind of, they get weird. I think they that's maybe where she is now. themselves and it's just very odd. She's just, be, yeah, making an exhibition of herself on social media these days because I guess, yes. yeah, just too much. <sighs> but anyway, like uh, also at this point in the hypothetical Double Dragon universe, Jerry Brown is vice president, which I would go into, but I'm pretty certain <laughs> no one cares. No one cares. Jerry no, Brown one, is, no one even refers to it that much. It's just, yeah, it's not. not. I mean, it, is in, it is interesting, but since I know you two don't know who Jerry Brown is, I'm pretty sure most of the listeners don't know either. Nope. I'm just not going to bother. <laughs> if you want Rob to tell, just email in or text email us. Email in somewhere. and I'll send it over to Rob and he can he'll send me the answer. <laughs> or, you know, just Google his name and uh, listen to uh, Dead Kennedys. All right. Just email Rob, it's fine. Anyway, uh, the news newscasters blame the Power Corps for blowing up a plane full of medical supplies. Oh, damn, damn, damn Power Corps with their dancing <laughs> skills. They're dancing. They've blown up a plane. And like Marion is watching this uh, at home, like her dad's a cop, and she go, and like she goes, "Oh, maybe it was drugs that actually got blown up." Yeah. But how would she know? How would she know? Mm. Who is she? Oh, dad, 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 who's a cop? I like the dad character. He's almost a bit. He's a he's a big cop, isn't he? And he he means well, but he's got to do his job. And he says, "You got to stay at home." You know, <laughs> <laughs> you got to stay at home. Leave it to the big men. Oh, we'll take control of this. <laughs> anyway, at this point, Shuko, a.k.a. Robert Patrick, comes to the Lee's dojo. And he used to know, like, Satori, back when he was called Geisman. Geisman? <laughs> I mean, this is a good coincidence, isn't it? I mean, that, that is good that they used to know each other. Yeah. And he's taken Shuko's name because of his name with an old Japanese warlord. Oh. He says he's changed his name because no one wanted to party with Victor Geisman. Uh, I would, to be fair. Yeah, Although, I, guess, uh, I don't know. No, he's got that cool hair, dude. You know, I'll party. No, the name, the name. Like you were Kugashuko. Oh yeah, I'll party. I'll party with Kugashuko, please. <laughs> like they kind of imply that they, the two of them used to be lovers back in the day. But like, uh, also, it turns out he's also the richest man in the world. But the film doesn't tell you that until like right near the end. Yeah, yeah. That is I, yes. I mean, but then he starts like signing these. Well, they. Um, oh no, I won't give away the plot point. Sorry. Yeah, but maybe he's a philanthropist and he just doesn't like to sort of boast about his wealth too much, you know? Yeah, if there's one word I would describe, I would use to describe Rob Patrick's character in this film, it would be humble. <laughs> anyway, like the brothers who it's, seem to live in a disused theatre, yep. like one away from like uh, Shuka's henchman and, woman, and like Linda Lash, and, but while like Shuka, Shuko slash Geisman, I'm just going to call him Geisman uh, from now on, yeah, Geisman. changed into a shadow. It does. And, I like uh, the they went away. They, it just lo- it looked awful, but I mean, it was yeah, it was like you know, I get it. Yeah. Anyway, like they they get caught up by a bobo who now looks like oh, yeah, he looks like a pudding basically. Now he looks he? a cross between sloth from the Goonies and fat bastard from Austin Powers. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know, what? I've I've got a I've have my own cross here, but it's completely different. <laughs> it's so interesting. <laughs> uh, I my notes say he looks like a cross between Bane and Batman and Robin. <laughs> like the really crap like version of Bane that only goes <laughs> uh, crossed with like Emil from Robocop after he gets a toxic waste splash yes, on him. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, he basically yeah. had a toxic splash on him. And then like yeah. uh Geisman kind of possesses Satori to try and like trick the brothers uh to get them to hand over the other half of the medallion, but it doesn't work. No. no. Anyway, like they set like the just the dojo on fire and uh 
Satori dies holding off like Geisman and like who then calls a meeting of all the gangs. They do actually kill her off. I mean, that's pretty. Brutal. I know it's quite sad actually. Yeah. Mm. And actually, like, there's a bit, Rob, you miss. I think they they drop loads of marbles or the pin. I think b- bubble gums. It was like Home Alone. It's like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> and like, it looks a bit like. Anyway, they call me. To the, he calls me to the gangs. It looks a bit like that bit at the start of the Warriors. Yes, yes, the Warriors. I've got that down as well. Yeah. Yep. But like, it's taking place in the video for ACDC's Thunderstruck, which I don't know if anyone's seen. No. Some of the viewers, some of the listeners would have. But cracking video. It looks like a bit like that. Like. You- Rob, you, you missed a bit before. I like the bit, actually, when he played the piano as a shadow ghost. you remember that bit? No. Yeah, he was like a shadow, and he kind of put his fingers over the, the piano. and Oh, yeah, he just cool. kind of like fleetingly like plays the piano on his way somewhere else, doesn't he? I remember that scene. I thought that, I thought that, that was... That's pretty cool. Come on, man. And my my favourite... Who's your favourite gang in the gangs? Because I reckon I'm gonna, he's... I'm going to get on to the gangs okay. <laughs> very shortly. Okay. In the next... Because they do actually feature extensively in the scene coming up. Because... <laughs> But like, uh, yeah, all these gangs. And like, uh, one of them goes like, "Ugh, we don't stab this in the sky." But then like, Geisman turns into his shadow and like he strangles him. <laughs> <laughs> and like, ever, all the gangs go, "Yeah, okay, we'll follow you." <laughs> yeah. Uh, meanwhile, the power core pulling out a Bobo out of the theater fire wreckage. He's still alive. Yes. Thank God for that. <laughs> yeah, we needed more Bobo in the film. <laughs> So at this point, like the gangs, are like uh, they all like we're after like the Lee brothers, and they catch up with them at what happened. Looks like a scrap metal dump, mm. and there's like a kind of cool fight. Like most of them look even stupider than the baseball furies <laughs> from the Warriors. <laughs> like I've got here, one gang is made up of postmen, oh, no. postal workers. <laughs> oh, no. Another, another like all the gang members are literally dressed like Ouija me cranky. <laughs> I feel like they were really scratching around for inspiration. I, with the there was also a gang that were mimes, weren't they? I think they're dressed like mimes, doing like you know mime things. No, that, that, isn't that the Warriors? Oh, I is don't there, know. Is there also a mime gang in this? Who like, knows? Anyway, yeah, if you're listening, delivery men were the worst. If you're listening to this and you don't know who Jimmy Cranky is, again, like Google it very quickly. <laughs> but that's definitely what one of the gangs. Like. It's definitely Jimmy Cranky and not Nicholas Sturgeon. All right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, Boris. <laughs> anyway, uh, like the Lee brothers steal a jet ski slash speedboat, which leads to a jet ski chase. And at this point, there's a really decent visual gag, which actually makes no logical Wait, sense. Oh, uh, Rob, you missed it. What you know? What before they stole the <laughs> before they stole the speedboat thing, they looked at this really weird motorbike. Do you see that? It looked like a Meccano motorbike with like almost like mixed with Tron. I was like, this is gonna be badass. They're like, oh, we can't get this chained up. We we'll just use the boat. Who made that prop? They probably made the prop. They couldn't actually get it to work in the film, <laughs> know, so they had to I change know. the script. I know. But anyway, like, there's a great visual gag, which, even though it makes no logical, no logical sense, is really cool. Like, they kind of they on these jet skis going across the river, and they go past the Hollywood sign, which right now is just above River Height. Oh, yeah. I just thought it looked great. Like, just a great idea, even yeah, though again. They were just like on land, like just down the road. That yeah. makes, and that's like halfway up a hill. Anyway, but you brought they, up one, one last thing. Just backtrack a little bit. When they're doing that big fight, a delivery man fell from the air. He sort of he, he threw himself off the seat, <laughs> off the top floor, and landed on the brother and said, "Air mail." Air that mail. Was his... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember that. I didn't put oh, the notes, but I do remember that. Sorry, yeah. And, uh, yeah, like, they get away again. By this point, the brothers are in their famous red and blue outfits, like in the games. And they go and, like, find the power core to get help. But, like, unfortunately, half the power core seem to be children. And, like, the Lees can't still, still can't get the medallion to work. They're half the medallion. The power half the medallion. Anyway, like, the power core use skateboards to create a diversion at Geisman's headquarters. It's, like, corporate headquarters where he hangs out. Uh, meanwhile, like, the Lee brothers and Marion are getting through events at the side. At this point, like, there is a disgustingly sexist and not at all amazing shot where, like, the camera literally zooms in on Marion's ass for a close-up as they're going through the vent. I think that's And, like, what, the leaders yeah, look at each other and they're like, whoa. <laughs> it was a little bit... It was, it was a bit too much, really. And, like, it's supposed it's to be like, a kid's film, isn't it? Let's be honest. It, you know. It is, like, again, disgustingly sexist and not at all incredible, but, like, the camera literally zooms in on her ass, which... Uh, yeah, it's... It's a nice art. It's a nice bomb. And, a nice uh, and but, when she, but when she goes to the vent, the leaves like look at each other and they go, and they all both scramble to try and get an afterwards. Yeah, the first one in. 
I know. And I think there's another similar joke a bit further along in, in the film as well. I think they do it twice. I mean, come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, at this, she's also wearing a very tight-fitting top and hot pants. Yeah. Like, which leads me to the question, which, how many times did the two of you rewind the film at this point? I was watching my family, thank you very much, my, my kids and my wife. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. My, wife, my wife refused to watch the film. So I watched it by myself Ooh, in the dark. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I didn't. Re- I didn't rewind it either. Yeah, <laughs> moving on quickly. <laughs> Did you... uh, anyway, yeah. yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Have you not spoke about bo- a bobo and spinach yet? Have I gone too far ahead? Oh, that's later on. Oh, sorry, sorry, my bad. Um, I think it's later on. Like, anyway, Mary. Let me uh, hang on a sec. I'm just going to check my notes. Pretty sure I did because uh... I had a feeling it was when they they kind of met in that um, escape rink kind of area. No, uh, I think you're right. I might have actually missed that out. Basically, like uh, like the power core have a bobo and they decide to torture him by feeding him healthy food or spinach or something. <laughs> Almost like oh, it's like just no more spinach. You know that that scene in Simpsons where the home has got the unlimited donuts. It's like that spoon. <laughs> I actually like whilst I was watching it, I messaged I messaged Adrian and Keith, and I was like, "Why are they feeding feeding spinach to a bobo?" Like, <laughs> do you feel sorry for him, Dylan? I was like, "This is That's so what, yeah. surreal. This is like, <laughs> how? Why am I even watching this?" But yeah. Poor anyway, guy. like uh, Marion's plan at this point is to upload false info into the Geisman mainframe, so the gangs will mutiny against him. But the leads completely ignore that because, you know, she's a woman who wants to listen to a woman, oh, apparently. They're so sexist. And, uh, they call through the vents to find, like, Geisman, and he's in his office trying to bribe a policeman. Who's Marion's father? That's a weird coincidence. Like, as I think we implied earlier, he doesn't know she's in the power core uh, or that she's rocking that sweet blonde uh, pixie cut. That's true. But, like, they're directly above his office. And Billy's plan involves lowering a necklace or something oh. to pull up the other half of the medallion from the desk. <laughs> Jesus. And they fail miserably at it. <laughs> <laughs> the worst bit of that scene is when the blonde lady wasn't. Is it the lash? She just looked up. She was. She must be. I don't want to sound rude to her, but she isn't the smartest because she she looked up, going, "Huh?" And she was literally looking for about. It seemed like tw- like half like a minute, obviously less. But like, come on, what are you doing? You you've seen something. Alert your boss. Oh. Adrian, like, I've got to disagree with you on this. She does see it go back up, and she grabs this big-ass, like, naginata from the wall. That's like a, one of those big Japanese spear swords. Oh, no. And literally starts stabbing up through the ceiling vents. Oh, God, God is, that like, in a conversation with the cop. Oh. And, like, she, oh. everyone falls through the ceiling into the office. But once again, they all escape. In this case, down a lift shaft. And, like, uh, Marion's dad, the cop, fights Linda Lash. But, you know, because he's part of the notoriously gunshot LAPD, he isn't carrying a gun. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. he does manage to win the fight by tipping a statue on her. That's, That's how you do it. There's always a statue handy. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, like, the Lees have found what looks like a morgue full of undead mutants who are maybe clones of a, a Bobo. I wasn't really sure. Yeah, this the dark, so yeah, yeah the thing with the dead undead things. Is they're, um, they're guinea pigs, aren't they? They're like the failed... Uh, you know, what's that being the alien with Bobos? Yeah, you see those dodgy aliens in those tubes. They just failed the bobos, and they're not. They don't really come back from life. I think they get repossessed by um, Geisman, yeah, Geis, Geisman or whatever his name He's is. He's like yeah. kind of possessing them in between going shadow and taking over machines. Mm. But like, uh, Billy and Marion escape, but they can't save Jimmy. Like he was getting like bear hugged by kind of one of these Geisman like possessed zombies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, Geisman tells Jimmy he knew their father back in the day, and he killed them. Yes. But, like. Ooh. Like they didn't know that until then. Yeah. The yeah, they didn't. They didn't. Uh, anyway, uh, the gangs all break into Power Core HQ and uh, like start fighting all the Power Core. And the fight's probably about fifty-fifty until Jimmy comes in. He's now on, under like is he under Geisman's mental control? Or is he, was he possessed? He is well, no, possessed Rob, by Geisman now. Sorry, sorry to backtrack. You forget the scene. It's just before this. They're in an, ar- an arcade, weren't they? They're fighting for an arcade. And... No, just, that's coming up in a minute. Oh, yeah, sorry, Thingy Bob on, beats Thingy Bob up and he falls on the arcade machine, doesn't he? Sorry, Rob. Sorry. Yeah, like it's probably about 50 50 at this point. Like Jimmy comes in, he's being possessed by guys, and he starts kicking Billy's ass. And the fight kind of goes into an arcade, and the possessed Jimmy so kicks in the screen of a double dragon arcade game. Yeah, meta. 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 Yeah, it's cool. It's a nice touch. I like, didn't uh, like how anyway. they smashed up those other arcade machines, though. That, that's, yeah. that's, that's like sacrilege to us now. 
<laughs> it's like we can't watch that. Like, stop smashing them up. They yeah, need to yeah. be restored. Yeah. Uh, anyway, like Billy gets frustrated at this point because like, he can't get the medallion to work. He gets frustrated. And he throws, tries to throw the medallion away. That's ridiculous. Literally at this point, considering like the, the guy was trying to get the other half of the medallion, is literally the dumbest thing he could possibly do. <laughs> I know. I just I, when I was watching that, I think, come on, mate, you're not that stupid. He is. But, I don't. I just don't. I just. Uh, I don't know. The whole <laughs> Billy. Oh, the Billy. Billy's just a bit just, dumb, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> But, like, uh, when he tries to throw it away, like, it goes into the air and then it lights up and goes back to him and fills it with, with power. Apparently, that was all you need to do, like, try and get rid of it, which, okay. You try yeah. and get rid of it. Okay. It's quite a, you know. It's the odd, isn't it? We li- we've lost Rob's audio. We lost- oh, no, not Rob's. Oh, God. What is. Rob! So I'm just I wanted to pause it for a sec so I could I just need to go to the bathroom quickly. Okay, let's pause now. <laughs> <laughs> Do I leave this bit in or <laughs> cut it out? Rob's going for a pee pee. Adrian, have you gone now? Adrian's gone as well. Oh, hello, Dylan. Oh, Adrian's back. Oh, thank God. I'm back. You all right? Yeah. How are you feeling? I was like, oh, man. Adrian's gone. <laughs> A bobo. <laughs> A bobo, man. All the spinach, dude. Serious. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, what a day. What a day, mate. What a day of lovely <laughs> podcasting. And Double Dragon, mate. Double though. Dragon. <laughs> the movie. And... Do you know, I'm gonna, I, actually, I've actually, i quite enjoyed it in a funny way. It's so stupid. If we save it for the pod, obviously. Duh, but... oh, I was really bad. <laughs> I really, it was really a struggle for me to watch it. I was so... <laughs> you almost gave up. I almost really That's... gave up. It was that spinach thing, wasn't it, Dylan? The sp- a bobo <laughs> spinach thing. Uh. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It was crazy. It was crazy. Oh man, what are you doing tomorrow? Anything good? Um, what are we doing tomorrow? Days tomorrow. Saturday tomorrow. Saturday. We've not got anything planned, I think. Actually, are you going to Lloyd Park on Sunday then? Yeah, are you up for it? Yeah, what are you doing? What kind of thing? Just. Standing two me more than two meters, like away kicking from the you. football to each other, sort of thing. I don't even think we're allowed to do that, are we? We just have to kind of yeah. shout at each other and go, "Hey, how you doing over there?" Random, <laughs> random person I've met, I've seen that I know in the park. That, yeah. This is this is a strange. You guys are both wearing t-shirts that look the same. Cool. They say arcade attack on them. <laughs> Why are you all wearing the same t-shirt? That's odd. <laughs> Who's, is, is Keith coming in? What's the, what's the plan? I think Keith was up for it, but I don't yeah. know. I don't, I'm not, I'm not sure he's that desperate to see anyone. But actually, when, when we did our little visits the other day, it was really good seeing you guys. It was. Did you see Keith as well? It was quite good for the old soul. No, so no one's visited Keith. So, I don't know. We'll see. I mean, we'll see. because his job involves driving around Croydon anyway, mm. I figured even if we don't see him Sunday, we could just get him to stop off at the park on his working day when he's driving to somewhere. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And then just see him that way. But I don't know if he's going to bring Nikki in that. We'll have to see. But it's just... Yeah. um, yeah. Are you two going to be on the uh, call tomorrow? Yeah, should be. Should be. We can discuss it then and social distancing. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, sorry about having to kind of cut off then, just like I've been gagging for a slash for like... Yeah. Like probably about twenty minutes. <laughs> um, yeah, and <clears throat> please, please don't stitch me up by like including that bit in the finished no, recording. Of course, I'm not. Um, what we'll we do wouldn't. then? Um, let's just all be silent for a bit, and then Rob, you just carry on, and then it'll be easier for me to see on the sound wave, and then I can just chop it out. All right. So let's all be quiet, and then Rob will carry on in about five seconds.
so basically, Billy gets like the medallion back, and he at this point he's basically invulnerable, and he starts winning the fight easily. Like he knocks the medallion, <laughs> and like he knocks the uh, medallion off, like mm. off Jimmy. But in all the confusion, like somehow Geisman and Sashuko manages to get both halves. Oh, like man, Billy is all it's awful. But, like uh, he kind of gets both halves and like turns into a double orc ninja. Like basically, like he kind of splits into two, and they're both like orc ninjas. Oh. But ama- somehow, amazingly, the orc ninjas still can't beat the brothers at kung fu. But I know, and it's like mm-hmm. that's meant to be the ultimate power of the medallion. It's a turn yeah, but you forget, ninja. Dylan. They were training. The two brothers were training for that special move where they kind of sort of flip each other. Oh, didn't the they? flippy, that... spinny, flippy thing. Yeah. Or okay. aliens weren't expecting that move, were they? That's why. <laughs> I mean, that's going to defeat anything, isn't it? Really? <laughs> you know, nuclear also... bomb. No, do the f- do the spinny, <laughs> kicky thing. <laughs> also, at this point, there's maybe my favourite line in the entire movie. Uh, it's a terrific line where, like, uh, one of the Orc Ninjas, like, they're both guys, or, like, one of the Orc Ninjas says, like, Billy, like, you're weak like your father, who obviously he killed. And his reply is, you're ugly like your mother. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's such yeah. a kid's movie, isn't it? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Boom. <clears throat> anyway, like, uh, Abobo is still out back at this point, like, in the Power Core headquarters, like, but he's caught a glimpse, uh, like, of himself in the mirror, and, like, he's like, oh, what have you done to me? And... Mm. He's like super pissed. How he has tells he Marion just realised what they've no. done to him? <laughs> Can he not like, see his he... own arms? <laughs> and like, and he, t- he tells Marion to turn the generators on so they can get the like the lights back. Yeah, because obviously, like uh, I say, obviously, I only realised this after it happened. Geisman but like, has got glaucoma or something, can he? He's a shadow ninja without like. Uh, and so like there's more light he can't really kind of work as well in shadow uh, uh, obviously it doesn't really make much sense because you need light in order to get shadow but anyway um, <laughs> like they kind of turn the lights back and like the Auckland just go Ugh! like they're really weak now and uh, they kick his ass because he's still bad at martial arts even like you know with the medallion's power and like so he loses the medallion like they the brothers put it together and they get these, I've got to say, simply fabulous red and blue ninja outfits. Yeah. Oh, my words. The like, quote. Like the ones. Got, oh. Yeah, I think. I like haven't got it down. Double, what is the quote? Double Dragon 3. I mean, it's, yeah. Mm. I've got mark. the quote within the tweets. So I'll save it. But it's something about, you know, why have you got the blue suit? Like, oh, anyway. Oh, yeah. And the ghost of, like, uh, <laughs> Satori appears and tells, like, them they have to guard the double dragons. They like humiliate like Geisman for a bit, and then um, they possess him and get him to give himself up to the police and donate 129 million dollars <laughs> to the police department. Before yeah. they did that, Rob, they made him hit himself. Why are you hitting yourself? Why are you hitting yourself? <laughs> Why? That's so nine. Oh my word! It's so nineties. It's brilliant. But like you know, I'm not like I'm not surely how it works if you kind of give yourself up to the police and then donate 100 and whatever million dollars to the police department. Oh. Doesn't really feel like it's going to bode well for the trial, but, uh, yeah, bribing, okay. Yeah, bribing the police. Uh, okay, great. And, and, like, at this point, the police have, like, said, oh, no, we can't possibly go out at night, have decided they aren't cowards after all and come out at night to arrest him. Yeah. They do. They, they stand up, the whole crew, like, we're going to take back the streets. We're not do afraid you of darkness what, anymore. Do you remember what Geisman's last line of the film is, Adrian? Because uh, it's a bit like Rocky Five. No, I think I haven't got that down. You think I'm bad? Wait till you meet my lawyers. <laughs> oh, blimey! Uh... Yeah, that's so Rocky Five. Jesus. And then the farm come in with all together now. No, oh. not quite. Uh, oh, okay, things. sorry, sorry. The brothers, the dragons, have a retooled dragon wagon. <laughs> the name of their car. They fixed oh, it. Yes, of course. Them, yeah, Marion's the, the fixed power it. And also, yeah, the power and also a Bobo wants to be friends with them. And like, I know full circle. Feel, they all get into the car and they'll speed off to the distance to all together now by the farm. But they let a Bobo drive, which is very stupid. And then he drives uh, them into a wall or something. I don't know. He doesn't. He drives them into the sunset, <laughs> the horizon. Yeah. It's like a, a character arc film, isn't it? Where you see the rise and fall and the rise again of a Bobo. I think that's the whole point of I the think film. It's really. They should rename it Rise of a Bobo. Should they? <laughs> yeah. Surely that's a sequel. <laughs> yes. It, yeah. Return a Bobo's of a Bobo's Revenge. A Bobo's Revenge. <laughs> anyway, I was trying to find kind of good trivia on Double Dragon because usually, like, you you know, these films, there's always kind of like some juicy backstage stuff. Mm. But uh, the best I could find was that Scott Wolf and Alyssa Milano apparently had a lot of fun in this film because they fell in love in real life on oh, set. Okay. They eventually moved in together and uh, 
we're going to get engaged, but uh, it didn't really last till marriage, unfortunately. Oh. Um, do you know who plays Alyssa Milano's brother in the film? Her little brother. He was her like a brother. Really annoying. Isn't it her actual brother? Yes, it's a real life brother. Oh wow, that's cool. Like in general, I think getting younger siblings or children of the main actors to play relatives never really works out in films. So it does, it, Adrian. Mm. <laughs> well, half and half, eh? Half and half. Yeah, half and half. Half and no, half. No, there's no half and half. Like every kind of every Sloan film with a, one of his children in is awful. Oh come on! No, don't be rude. Daylight's good and Rocky Five's Rocky good. Rocky Five is watchable. Is yeah. this kid? Not, isn't this kid an over the top as well? No, that's not his kid. That's another kid. Okay. Yeah. Actually, technically, around. his first son was in Rocky One. Um, the the babe. Uh, the baby. Rocky 2. Rocky, Rocky 2. Rocky 2, sorry. Okay. I should know, should know. Yeah, that's his first son. Anyway, uh, this film was released in November 1994. That was in the USA anyway. It was a bit of a staggered release everywhere else, which is not a sign of financial success. No. IMDb says it took more than a year to come out in the UK Ooh. and didn't make it to Japan until June 1999. What? Nearly <laughs> five years afterwards. That's a joke, isn't it? That is competition, joke. competition in the box office at this point. Uh, late 1994 was mainly Stargate which had come out the week before uh, I saw that in cinema, I don't know about you guys Ugh, I didn't like Stargate but I didn't you? I, I quite liked Stargate to be fair, I thought it was alright I think TV show seems to be a really kind of big cult thing mm-hmm. more than the film but anyway, Stargate had come out the week before the Coppola De Niro Frankenstein it was released the same week as uh, kind of um, Double Dragon mm. Interview with the Vampire and the Santa Claus came out the following weekend and Star Trek Generations the week after Mm. It's like, you know, some big films. Having said that, there were a lot of bombs around this time, too. Mm-hmm. Notably, Exit to Eden, a comedy where Dan Aykroyd and Rosie O'Donnell are like cops who go undercover on the BDSM slash fetish scene. I mean, oh, Dan God. Aykroyd and Rosie O'Donnell doesn't really <laughs> fill me with much. <laughs> well, we like Dan Aykroyd, don't even we? Even like they might be dressed as in leather PVC like <laughs> BDSM outfits. That... Yeah, I mean, that that is appealing, I'll be honest with you, but <laughs> no, even with that, yeah, it's a bit of a, bit of a, yeah. bit of a push. Yeah, um, also, but not the only flop around then, uh, there was also the Ron Beatty and Ed Benning remake of the Lo- of uh, Love Affair. The old, yeah, like, 30s film. That. Big budget, didn't make any money, much like all of Warren Beatty's films from the 90s onwards. Uh, and also uh, The War, which is a Kevin Costner slash Elijah Wood Vietnam veteran movie, which I'd never heard of before no. doing research for this. Mm. So, yeah, that was the uh, kind of environment Double Dragon got released into. Despite Peter Gould's incredibly dated IMDb pro like biography labeling Double Dragon a $20 million film, general consensus puts it at a $7.8 million budget. Uh, do you want to guess how much money it made at the box office? 7.9 million. Yeah, or double, it doubled it, like Double Dragon would. Uh, very optimistic. It actually made $2.4 million. Oh. <clears throat> Critical reception? Not good. I think it's got really bad Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> yes, uh, Rotten Tomatoes has, gives it a 13% score. 13%. There are 20, <laughs> but a 26% <laughs> audience score, which does, is a double, a double Dragon kind of thing. <laughs> yes! Double, double Dragon! We got there eventually. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yes, it was critically mauled. Um, I seem to remember when, over Christmas when we were talking about... Uh, oh, yeah, I, just, I can't believe I didn't say this at the beginning. The reason we're doing Double Dragon is it was part of the, the Christmas kind of gift-giving thing. I gave and it. we actually yeah. asked people on Twitter which of these like films, which included, I believe, both Tekken yeah. and... Uh, House of the Dead, say? wasn't it, for Keith, I think, was it? I can't remember now. No, um, and uh, Street Fighter Assassin's Fist. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah uh, we asked. Uh, yeah, oh, I think, Final like, Fantasy maybe... because Adrian got me Final Fantasy, didn't he? Think, <laughs> we did. Yeah. <laughs> it was, and it was whoever tweeted us first, wasn't it? Or yeah. Whoever messaged us first. Who was yes, it that Double messaged Dra- us about this? I there was someone, and it, I can't remember the name. Oh, sorry, if you listen, they're I'm really listening to it right now. But thanks like, to whoever it was. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you are the anonymous hero who uh, was responsible for this <laughs> review. But uh, yeah, when we were talking about this. Um, I can't remember whether it was that episode or not, but basically Double Dragon was one of, at the time, four films in IMDb's bottom 100. Wow. People know there's an IMDb top 250. They do not know there's a bottom 100. Well, some people do, obviously. Mm. But at the time, there were uh, four video game films that were in the bottom 100, one of which was Double Dragon. But it's no longer there, like despite oh. having a rating of 3.8. But 
out of 10. I suspect because there's fewer reviews than many of the other films on the list, like it is weighted. Mm-hmm. It's like the more bad reviews something gets, like the more it's kind of the more lower down it is. Having said that, House of the Dead, I believe, is in the top 10. <laughs> <laughs> that's what? next then rob that's next then mate you, we, we're, we're finally pushed dylan to the other side can you imagine <laughs> no just no please <laughs> you, you, you almost came up in it dylan already with a bobo you can't do it. a bobo i found are we going to talk about our sort of general well, feelings about no, the but, film soon or? uh no, but, yes well before we do that adrian i believe has some twitter input about this oh yeah we, oh god oh yeah but rob are you can talk about the the game quickly should we should we do that um I didn't really do much research on this, but there was, much like Street Fighter, there was a video game adaptation of the movie of the game. <laughs> it came out on the Neo Geo. It was like yeah. Street Fighter, a head-to-head beat-em-up. And like Street Fighter, it was not too successful or critically appreciated. I've, yeah, I've got it up here. It's literally just called Double Dragon, which is a bit confusing. But it was released on the Neo Geo. And I think it's later went to the Neo Geo CD and PlayStation. Mm-hmm. And it was made by Technos, uh, based on a Night Night 4 film. Mm-hmm. And apparently it's, very, it's a typical one-on-one fighting game, but the, the big difference is there's not specific punch and kick buttons. Um, apparently where you kind of move and how you sort of walk and so forth and you press a button, that will determine if it's a punch or a kick. Weird, eh? Mm, uh, sounds like it's completely unworkable. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Um, the characters and settings are inspired by the Double Dragon movie, which feature prominently in the game's intro. This includes uh, the submerged Hollywood sign, as we, said, as we spoke about. There's also the dragon wagon in Billy's stage. And there's also the Lee's brother's transformation technique. We'll talk about that later on. Mm. Um, yeah, so there's a little homages to the, to the movie, but the reviews were negative overall. There you mm. go. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, like, uh, I in re- like in prep for this, I to say I had low expectations would be an understatement. I was just hoping I could get through the full kind of thing in one sitting. But actually, I I found it surprisingly enjoyable. Like, it is there's no way it deserves to be anywhere near the bottom 100 on IMDb. And I'll say this: this is the fourth film we have reviewed on this. It is by far the second best film we've covered. Oh. But, I mean, I, I would put it obviously below Sonic because that was legit a good film, but mm. definitely far above both Street Fighter and Super Mario Brothers. Mm. Mm. Do you know what, Rob? I, I, I let didn't have his say in a minute. I actually enjoyed the film as well, surprisingly. I, I went in there saying, look, guys, I, I spoke to my family. I've got a focus group. We've got a mission to do. We've got to watch this film. And I'm like, oh, Dad, do we have to? This is going to be a, such a nice film. I'm like, it is. It's going to be rubbish, but good. And I was like, please be rubbish, but good. And it was rubbish, but good. And I felt <laughs> it was quite enjoyable in a silly way. It wasn't going to win any Oscars. It's not going to, uh, you know, give you any extra brain cells. But you know what? It was surprisingly enjoyable and fun. And it didn't take itself too seriously. And I know there's a debate whether, it, whether it's too childish or it should have been a bit dark and grittier. But in a funny way, I think they pitched it kind of right. And it was kind of like a pantomime over the top silly film and sometimes you're in the mood for that so uh, yeah you know what it was stupid but good i don't think i was in the mood for it i'm going to put it down to that (laughs) because it just i found it really hard going i mean there were you know there's there's bits of light relief in it it's kind of kept me going to the end and the fact that i had to watch it for the pod but i think voluntarily if i had said oh double dragon i quite like the game I'll give this a watch. I probably turned it off after about ten minutes. I found it. I found it really, mm. really hard going. It's just nothing. It's just it's so fragmented, and I just I like I have to persist with this. And it's just oh my god, Scott Wolf is really like um, <laughs> enthusiastic. He's just too enthusiastic for me. Just just, just tone it down a little bit, mate. God, just come on. Just Do you know what, Dylan? Unfortunately, I see a bit of Scott Wolf in me, a little bit uh, hyperactive sometimes. Oh, mate, you've got nothing on him. I'm sorry, <laughs> he's just on another planet in this in the, on this movie. In this movie, he must have had about ten Red Bulls. I don't even think Red Bull was a thing then, was it? Ninety four uh, might have been. Um, no, I think it was more Jolt Cola at that point. Mm-hmm. So he had a lot of Jolts. Oh my god. Um, I just find it hard, <laughs> but you know, the, I like that. That's where he went. The jolts, nothing drug related or illegal. <laughs> it must hey, be happy hey, no, hey, we like Scott Wolf. You know, no we defend him. No one who ever acted in a child's movie was on mm-hmm. drugs, right, kids? Yes, kids. Scott listening? Wolf would be howling if he could hear you. Howl. Oh, oh. Matthew Fox. Yeah, but, um, <laughs> it was. Yeah, I found it really hard going. I think. I think. 
it has enough interesting bits about it where it might it might warrant an arcade attack remake. But I think that's <laughs> yeah. that's about as that's about as praise praiseworthy as I can get. Who was your favourite actor, Robert, Robert Patrick? Then was he a favourite? Yeah, Robert yeah, Patrick's thought... easily the best thing in it. I mean, it, Alyssa, I... Alyssa Milano's good. I think mm-hmm. she's not given she's the best lines. She's not given the best lines. They've re- they've really stitched her up as far as the script goes. But <laughs> yeah. you know, she does. She does. You can tell that she's Hollywood, and like the others are like TV, aren't they? Apart from Robert Patrick. I feel like the acting was generally right. Like, mm. I mean, I'm just going to go like do what I thought of the film. I thought the acting was generally right. Uh, there were some great lines, and the plot holes. There were obviously plot holes. Like, why didn't Satori tell them how to use the power medallion? Yep. Or like, didn't she know? Mm-hmm. And like, I wasn't really a fan of the she fart joke. She clearly would have known. I just yeah, I don't know. And there was like this lot, this awful fart joke with like a bobo oh. and the power core. That scene, which I wasn't a fan of. No, fart <laughs> like, jokes. Yeah, fart jokes. Gratuitous. <laughs> Things. But like Robert Patrick was good. I thought Mark uh, De Casos, like De Cascos. De, anyway, De Cas- he can do martial arts. Yeah, De Cas- Yeah, he, he can do martial arts pretty well. And even yeah. though Scott Wolf plainly can't fight, I felt like the cutting around that was like, even though it was kind of apparent, it wasn't obtrusively obvious. Yeah, I felt like the chemistry between the two brothers was pretty good. Like they Relatively worked kind of well together. Yes. Like um, special effects, obviously low budget film it was pretty ropey but having said that i thought like the ba- the backgrounds of the ruined la one of which like has hollywood boulevard underwater and the other's like focusing on the collapsed for like capital records building i thought those looked genuinely terrific i think some of the like, imagery is really interesting that's why i say i think there's enough sort of interesting bits about it to you know to, to expand on mm. i mean we kind of i found it really hard man i found it really <laughs> hard talked, watching it like we talked about the jet ski scene, like the jet ski chase scene, and I yeah. thought like the effects in that were a lot better than in the surfing scene in Escape from LA, which literally came out two years later and had mm. a much bigger budget. Mm. And like, and the explosion that caps off that scene looks awesome too. Yeah, it does. Yeah, this immense explosion apparently used 700 gallons of gasoline, <laughs> 200 gallons of alcohol, and uh, they filmed this in like Ohio. It caused local residents to make more than 200 phone calls to local emergency <laughs> services in 10 minutes. Despite there being widespread warnings in the news the day before, like local news that it was going to happen, <laughs> like I mean, yeah, the effects are dodgy, but it really feels like maybe a two or three, maybe even five, like five million dollars extra would have made a big difference mm. in terms of like how the like those kind of like ghost effects and the computer stuff, and maybe give like a script a final polish. I felt like that would have made a big difference. Mm. Do you know what, Robin Dylan? I don't know if I told you this, but I've seen this film before. I watched it when I was quite young. But I couldn't have been that young, but I actually saw it when I was um, at my Uncle Victor's house and we went to this news agents. And you know how some dodgy news agents that some of them used to rent out VHSs, oh, remember yeah. those? Oh, yeah. And they never had the best. <laughs> They're like, oh, we're not going to get the, the top ga- the top uh, movies. So I went to there with my, my uncle once and we wanted a film that all me and my two brothers could watch. And my younger brother, you know, Chris was a bit younger then, so we couldn't watch anything too inappropriate, even though by then I've seen Robocop and stuff and I was like oh what's this film it's Double Dragon and I was I'm a big fan of the, the series back then the games mm. so we, we got it never heard of it before Truth never knew it was actually released as a film um, and I sat down we watched it at my Uncle Victor's house and I was like yeah this is a bit silly <laughs> and as kind of slightly you know sort of middle sort of 13 14 year old I don't know how I was it was like yeah it's a little bit you know I'm better than this I've watched Terminator by now but <laughs> looking you know so as a sort of teenager I was like yeah this is not cool enough for me they're trying too hard to be cool but now I'm like, yeah, maybe I've just not got, I've got really uncalled all of a sudden. There you go. I think like for me, kind of, apart from like, I guess the kind of budgetary stuff, a big issue, and I think we've kind of, we've kind of circled around this a bit, is that uh, the tone of the film is a bit like, actually quite similar to both Super Mario and Street Fighter. Like, the tone mm-hmm. of the film is a bit all over the place. I think much like those kind of films, there was not a kind of cohesive, Consistent artistic vision behind there. No, you can just up with that. I mean, they're, <clears throat> well, they're all so scattergun. It's just they are scattergun. I just, well, you could just tell. I mean, like we kind of went to the back, the background of those other two films. Like, obviously, studio director, like the kind of games companies had quite different ideas of what they wanted from this. And you could just tell Game Informer in this interview, he felt that he and the producers had different ideas of what the film should be. Mm. Like he reckons they should cut the violence and innuendo a bit to go from a 12 to a PG. Mm. Though, uh, you know, apart from the teenage shots, it feels very PG to me. Like, 
I yeah, mean, it, I mean, they could have easily cut it down a bit. They would have expanded their audience. I mean, mm-hmm. they would have made a lot more money from it, I think, if they'd have done I that. I mean, the thing is, like, if this was released in the mid-80s, it would have got a PG rating, no problem. Like, mm-hmm. PGs in the 80s, when they were first, that rating was first introduced, was stuff like Gremlins. And mm-hmm. There were still swear words in some PG yeah. films. Yeah, Goonies, then, yeah. I think, are swear words as well. Mm-hmm. Like, just, it was kind of like kids' films that could have kind of swear words in and violence. Mm-hmm. And that kind of stuff. It just feels that like maybe it was the like released at the wrong time. But actually, I think having watched this now, I think if anything, the producers were right and you could just wrong, and they should have really dr- driven it up to a twelve and made it a little bit more adult. Mm. I certainly feel like the kids' audience is really there for that. I think like it would have made a difference if they kind of made it a little bit dark and actually gone mm. full on for that kind of thing. And then kids would have been like, ooh, this is like, I want to sneak in and like, like <laughs> do this. And like, it might go, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It might have, I think it, it needed a, it needed a change. I think it needed a change from, from what it's ended up as. But, mm. They could have gone full out like 15 or <laughs> 18. 18 and just Imagine. gone like, made it like a, like a really hard, like Jean-Claude Van Damme type, like vehicle. Well, Speaking of Jean-Claude Van Damme, double impact. I know. A lot of people saying that. I was kind of shoehorning the... that. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Dylan. It is double. In... They're like saying, "Oh, double impact is the is the film that Double Dragon deserved." Yeah, yeah, to a degree. I could see that. I mean, Double Impact is not a good film, but then neither it's is Double Dragon. Yeah, so... <laughs> it's better. Than I don't know. Like, have you seen it recently? No, I haven't. I used to love it as a kid. Double. double. Pretty bad. I mean, you guys know. I mean, what we're all kind of we all like Van Damme yeah, yeah. up to a point, well, but two like of them. I would, Come on. <laughs> I mean, I would not put it in the top five Van Damme films. Ooh. No, no, of course not. I might sw- sneak into mine. Ooh. And you know, like after the top five, it's quite a steep fall, much like the top five Seagal films. Yeah, yeah. It's a pretty steep yeah. fall Under after siege, the top and then <laughs> it all, obviously um, one Heart Killers obviously two yeah. and I guess you're looking at probably Above the Law mm. maybe Out for Justice I don't know like do you can't executive decision in this anyway the rest are all, the rest are awful <laughs> like through the unwatchable Jean-Claude Van Damme I think you're looking at obviously Time Cop Kickboxer Blood Universal Sports. Soldier yeah Universal Soldier all up there I think after that there's a bit of a steep fall actually Nowhere to Run is pretty good like yeah. no, sorry, I Nowhere to Run no, I'm thinking of Hard Target. Hard Target's a- the one. Rob, I saw AWOL recently. That's all right. Well, I, when was that released? Don't know. What about but Sudden it's... Death? Where's Sudden Death in this, eh? Sudden yeah. Death's right. Is Sudden Death the really crappy one with like a, di- a version of Die Hard like in a hockey stadium? Yeah. <laughs> that fi- that's a bad film. Oh, come on, people. It's like an ITV4 mainstay. <laughs> but, oh, um, yeah. yeah, I've... Yeah, Nowhere to Run's kind of watchable, but not a good film. Anyway, like, I... Yeah, double... The- I guess double impacts in that kind of, that kind of batch that level. It's watchable, but not a good film. <laughs> Much like Double Dragon. Do you want to hear people's opinions on Twitter and Facebook? Let's. I do would it. love to. Let's do. This I, I sent out a tweet. I sent out a message on Facebook, and I said, "Look, what's your views on the mid '90s Double Dragon movie? Does the video game adaptation deserve two thumbs up, or or placed straight back in the bargain bin?" I'm guessing said, no one gave it two thumbs up. Well, let's have a look. Uh, good old Andy Endine. Hey Andy, we have to mention Andy, Andy every every podcast, don't we? <laughs> he always chips in. He said, <laughs> "I've never seen it." <laughs> Sounds like an informed viewpoint. Seen right? it. <laughs> he said, <laughs> "Great way to start." <laughs> no, but that's not the end of it. He said, "I've never seen it." To be honest, it's not too high on my to watch list either. <laughs> Oh, well, maybe that's going to change after he hears this. Exactly. Um, video game newsroom time machine. One word, by the way, believe it or not, uh, said only ever saw the trailer. That was enough. <laughs> Are there any opinions from people who've actually seen the film? <laughs> yes. Here's one. The top loader. Rob's, Bob... <laughs> Rob's best friend, Todd. Yeah. Is he dancing in the moonlight about it? <laughs> yeah. oh, top loader. Oh, say. He hmm. said... He said, I saw this in the movies. <laughs> Worst experience of my life. <laughs> Worst experience of my life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's not as bad as Free Willy 2, mate. That, that was my worst. That was my oh, worst dude. cinema trip. Jesus, what, what on earth was that about? Um, I mean, look, it, I've seen at least 50 films worse than this in my life. Like, I can probably yeah. name 20 in the next two minutes. Okay, but don't like, do that. No, we haven't got time for that. Yeah, but like, me... I've... 
uh, you know, this is it's not not a good film, but it's not a bad film. Well, no, Todd uh, goes on. He said, I saw this in the movies. Worst experience of my life since I normally like a good comedy movie. Not <laughs> not sure <laughs> how they can make a movie so bad, but props to them <laughs> as they did sure find a way. So instead of two thumbs up, <laughs> it gets the, big, the middle fingers. <laughs> Well, all I have to say, Todd, is that you need to watch this again with a couple of beers. Oh, dear. Oh, mate. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he he, he prefers bo- um, bourbon. Um, so <laughs> he'll, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get him some, some Jack Daniels or something. He can, he can, but, he can enjoy but it. But Dylan and Rob, I didn't tell you this. When I, ta- when I did this um, twi- tweet, I, I, you can tag in people. I actually found this wrestle duo called the Double Dragons. I thought, I'll just tag him in. <laughs> I'll tag him in, see what happens. Nice. And nice. He, they're like, I, these are proper legit wrestlers. I don't know how big they are, but they said, it's a video game movie filmed in the 90s, dude. Do you expect our <laughs> our opinion to be high? <laughs> dude? What was, it? what was his opinion, though? I wasn't expecting then, it to be high. And then what I said, fair play, they shared it, they retweeted it. I said, thanks for sharing. Is the film so bad it's good, though? Question mark. And they said, at least it's got Alyssa Milano, dude. <laughs> <laughs> dude, dude. I'm not sure if they like us. It's got Alyssa Milano, dude. Just like, shh. So the Double Dragons, they I mean, are... If they, if they gimmicks to call everyone dude, why is it not a cool thing to be a 90s video game film? Yeah, well, dude. Jeff Bogard and Johnny Lee here were Wrestle Christ's tag team champions, God's Power Rangers, and Winter Drill's Grey Wind and Ghost. It's morphing time. So they've got, an, they've got like, I think they're big fans of um, Power Rangers as well. There you go. Sounds like backyard level wrestling to me. <laughs> hey, they might listen to this pod, Rob, and they're, pretty, they're tougher than us. So you've got to be careful what you say. Yeah, we don't get beaten up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> dude. Well, are they British? Uh, no, I think they're, where are they based? They're based in Miramar, Florida. Well, lockdown conditions what are they going to do about it let's be honest <laughs> yeah they're going to have to quarantine for two weeks if they come over here <laughs> yeah the joke's on them yeah joke's um, on you <laughs> yeah double dragons um Charlie Cat we like a bit of F there so oh Anthony uh, yeah he that, says few that's yes. his new that's his new moniker Charlie Cat and he says few I mean wooey on the movie of double dragon <laughs> oh few <laughs> being a bit cheeky there few. uh Swooper D the, the old Dan Meister hi Dan he says, I've never seen it, but I really should. I mean, it's Double Dragon, and it features a frosted-topped T-1000. I don't know, Dan. I think you could probably pass on it, mate. I think you'd be, be all right. Well, no, Callie comes and says, you need to see it, Dan. It's glorious. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and Callie says, so, so bad, but brilliant at the same time. I really miss goofy movies like this. Yeah? yeah. Like, I mean, I've got to be honest. I don't think it is. I was expecting it to have it. A- to put it on that level, but actually, it's not that bad. I mean, it's not one of those so bad it's good movies. I think like it's kind of it's watchable for me. When it's gonna, stuff that works, stuff yeah. that doesn't. But when are we going to end up watching Pit Fighter the movie? <laughs> I didn't even know there was such a thing. Aha! There oh. surely Aha. is. <laughs> oh man, we, that would really be the end of it all. Um, I'm pretty sure House of the Dead is going to be on that level, like of, of so bad it's watchable or good. Yeah. Well, Michael yeah. Field chips in, and he says, it sucks as a movie, but it's good fun to watch if you are already expecting to see a bad film. There's a Neo Geo game of the film, which is pretty good, versus Fire. It oh. even plays crits, <coughs> clips from the film on the big screens in the background. That's cool, isn't it? So proper in-your-face uh, action there. Oh. One thing I do actually have to say in praise of the film is that I thought they got the tone in terms of the game right. Like, there's... A lot of stuff from the game in the film, but they don't really make a big deal out of it. But there's still nods to the game within the film. I thought it was done a lot better than in Street Fighter or Mario, although obviously not as good as, not as well as in Sonic the movie, which I thought did that terrifically. Hmm. But we've covered all these, so Graham Mason, Dylan. I think he's got one of our T-shirts. Graham, right? um, yeah, I think he listens. To us. Hello, mate. Thanks for supporting the show. And we like thanks him. Thanks for getting a tea. Um, what 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 does young Graham have to say? About he this? says, "Love it." There you go, Dylan. Even though it's terrible, I wrote this about it with one of my colleagues, and I kind of retweeted it. And he's got some sort of ant stream on it. Dare you watch Double Dragon the movie? There you go. <laughs> he says, "Is Double Dragon a rough, undiscovered diamond of a video game movie?" And he's got a little thing on there. I don't know what is ant stream like a. I don't know. Stream. What oh, okay. Right, right, right. So, so ant stream is a like a streaming, like a retro streaming service. Uh, okay. You can just play loads of retro games through your browser, I think. And um, I mean, they're, they're cool guys. We chat to them on Twitter quite a bit, but I haven't actually given the service a go yet. 
So I will have to dip into that and maybe we'll do a podcast on that at some point in the future. But yeah, it's good to know that people are using it anyway. We love anything that keeps retro going. So we okay. do, yeah. we do. And a comedy of gamers, they've chipped in. Oh, Matt. Yep. Thanks, Matt. Know. He said it's, it's so weird. Really make, makes no sense at all, but it's got Robert Patrick in it and the style is so 90s. The world is richer for this film existing. From what I've heard, production and rewrites were a bit of a mess. An interesting one to dig up into the history of. And I reply, I said, thank you. It does. I, it, hopefully Rob has done his research. So I hope Rob, you have. He does. And it is, it's an interesting movie to discuss, I think. So it might not be a good movie, but it's a good one to discuss. It's interesting. And it's a good one for, it's a good one for video game buffs to go and to. Odd, odd, yeah, apparently like, uh, oh, I, I yes, did actually, Rob. I didn't really mention it earlier, but I did do some more research into it. And Robert Patrick was actually interviewed by the AV Club. Like the AV Club mm. do this regular feature called Random Roles. They'll like interview kind of an actor and all the actress and like all the kind of stuff they've played in the past. And they talk, spoke to Robert Patrick and Double Dragon came up. Mm. He said like he wanted to, because he was a big Kung Fu fan. Mm. And like he was, he thought his performance was good, which again, we've all agreed with, but mm. he didn't really think the film turned out the way he expected it to. Oh. Okay. He didn't think he was that successful, but uh, yeah, maybe he wasn't thinking it would be more Kung Fu oriented. Who knows? If only I was, well, I was there. I should have gone up to him at, during Comic Con last year and said, Robert, mate, look, I've got a plan here. Double Dragon 2, the sequel. Bobo's Revenge. Are you up for it? <laughs> you never know. We might, get it we, might, production. we might have the opportunity to speak to Robert in the future. If we <laughs> you never, right never say never. If or if I go to Comic Con in the future. <laughs> so, odd quid. pod. 50 quid, 50 mate. Here you go. 50 quid. <laughs> like, Robert, do you know, Moving on. <laughs> That's what you can ask. <laughs> Odd Pod. I haven't watched it in years. I actually bought the DVD two years ago, and it's still sealed. Maybe I should watch it soon. I don't know. Keep it sealed. A sealed copy would be worth <laughs> millions. I mean. Yeah. I mean, I'll be honest. I probably wouldn't have watched it if I hadn't been given it as a present and we had to cover it. <laughs> I still haven't watched Tekken. I, still, I got that. <laughs> I got given that at Christmas. <laughs> We've got news. here. We go. DRGD Retro said, from what I can remember, this was terrible, but seeing as it's on Amazon Prime and I'm a sucker for punishment, I think I'll try and give it another go. <laughs> I think that's what people, it's on Prime, guys. Yeah. Watch it. So this week we're gonna, we're gonna tell Amazon Prime, but yeah. you literally can just get on there and stream it and thank <laughs> us later. Well, this uh, guy, this guy chipped in early. He's, he replied to his comment, is it VNL Apacon? pronounce it all wrong i'm sure he said it's on prime question mark and i already downloaded the torrent and he does a, a face palm um uh gif and he says wasted bandwidth with boo torrent. Man, download the torrent amazon are an evil company there you go so boo, just boo download amazon it and boo torrent well, just boo everything just, bu- just buy got, the dvd we've got merc here he says like the double dragon movie was okay i might have enjoyed it solely because it's double dragon but double impact was so more accurate to the double dragon game ah. lots of doubles Double and double. Retrocon Air, the Plotline Repair podcast, they said classic. <laughs> and it's a brilliant line. At least I don't have to wear the blue one. And then <laughs> they, they do fight pose. What's wrong with the blue one? Sad fight pose. And they show the screenshot of them wearing their new blue and red outfits. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I mean, that is ridiculous. I mean, what, is ridiculous. what is wrong with the blue one? I t- the blue outfit. It's, they're identical apart from being one red and one's blue, right? The, the blue, actually, if you play Double Dragon 3 from memory, I think the blue looks... They've made the blue look really turquoise and it looks <laughs> really, really odd and a bit silly. So maybe they just taken a mick out of that. I don't know. I, don't I mean, know. They, both, they both look a little bit Indian wedding, wedding to me, but yeah, they're both you know, that's very, not bad. Yeah, they're like Indian wedding outfits. Yeah. Well, Sri Lankan well, wedding we... outfits. I'm allowed to say that I'm Sri Lankan. Um, but yeah, it's... Yeah, it's... It's it's odd. It's odd. But you kind of want one now, right? You kind of want one of those outfits now. I Rob. wouldn't mind it having it in the rotation, but I don't know if I'd wear it out to say the park or something. What color? In the blue or red? Though. Blue or red? Oh, definitely red. Oh, the blue oh, one. You're such a blue oh. snob. Anyway, <laughs> Can we, any more tweets and things? Yeah, yeah. We're getting that Mads. We like Mads from Retro Asylum. Hello, you know, Mads. he we like him. He's always helping us out. He says, "I love it." I'm not sure why, but for me, this is pure 90s movie bliss. And he said, mine, and he showed a picture of his cover. I can't show a DVD cover. Mine has a different cover. I may have to watch this tonight. There you go. Oh, God, he's, he's with, oh, no. Now he hates <laughs> us. 
Yeah, sorry, Mads. Um, and I put it on Facebook as well, our um, lovely uh, Arcade Attack Extra Retro Gaming Facebook group, so please join. Mm-hmm. Um, but just don't talk about Double Dragon to our other admin, Nathan, our good friend Nathan, because he says, this movie is bloody awful. <laughs> <laughs> He's not wrong, is he? Let's be honest. Come on. Alex, Alex says, I'm pretty sure I watched it when I was a kid, but I don't remember much of it, to be honest. Same as me, but I watched it again, and there you go. Um, Jamie Taylor he thinks he, Taylor, Jamie Taylor. He thinks that you guys are like got a weird connection, Dylan, because he says that movie is on our list of upcoming episodes too. Have you been peeking at our list? Question mark. I think we're or like brothers. A, I think we're like brothers from another mother or something. We get we get like the same right. ideas and we come up with the same kind of crap. And yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Well, Got to make sure this is released before theirs in that case. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's a battle. Yeah, 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 it's a battle. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, Waffling and Taylors. And Nathan's chipped in again because he's seen this miss. Well, everyone's chipping away. But he, he, he's not going to leave it there. He says, I'm convinced the entire Arcade Attack admins. Sorry, Rob, you're not part of that group. <laughs> I think he means Arcade Attackers. I think he means all Arcade Attackers. Rob, you're in. You're back in. Could act better than these Muppets, lol. And then I said... And then Dylan said, don't accidentally start champion an AA Double Dragon remake because you know we would do it. And you know we would. And then Andy says to Dylan, I believe that constitutes a legally binding contract. Now you have to do it. We just need someone to fund it, really. Should we crowdfund it? And then Dylan says, smiley, uh, laughing faces. I think if that's going to happen, there needs to be a showdown between us and at least one other podcast like group where we like they have to remake a different video game film. Oh, what? And we're just, we're just remaking bad video game movies we could try and remake the trailer maybe have you seen that that, there's a great youtuber i can't remember who it is um and they remake trailers of famous films really badly have you seen that rob no but i'm interested it's it's very good i mean they they purposely make it rubbish um all right so steve white we we like a bit of steve white he says it pains me to say this about anything 80s so there you go sorry steve it's 90s but but it was terrible then and it is terrible now oh steve Steve doesn't even know which decade which decade is released in (laughs) We he like doesn't Steve mean White, that, Steve. But... He doesn't mean that. He doesn't mean. Yeah, that. we love Steve, really. Yeah. Of course uh, you do. We've known yeah. Steve for many years, many, many years. Yeah, he, he can take it. He's got a thick skin. He's yeah. good. Um, and then Faith Johnson, retro Faith. She just done that. I don't know who the um, the judge is, but Lord help me with this one. Just the face and hand one. Oh, kind of meme. Oh, gift the um, face palm. Face palm thing. Oh, here we go. Yeah. And Jamie chips in one last comment. He says, I've always said that the majority of movies that are based on video games will be relatively entertaining movies if you remove all connections to the games. Ba, ba, ba. It's true, though, isn't it? I mean, like, how is it actually linked to the game? It's very bare bones. Yeah, there's two brothers. There's someone called Marion in it. And that's about like <laughs> it, you know? It's the same characters, like, and the same clothes, and they do kung fu, and the double d- d- double dragon arcade game is in it. That's, that's, yeah, you, yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's basically <laughs> it. So, <laughs> that's it. But, but it is like like Super Mario Brothers. I will go back to this again because we can't stop talking about Super Mario Brothers, <laughs> the movie. It just it in no way is it like linked to the game or has any kind of resemblance to the game. But you know, it's a relatively watchable sort of take on a dystopian something something i mean when you consider like mario brothers cost more than six times as much as this film mm. i think you have to say this film probably oh yeah they did, could have used oh, they big did budget. way better yeah they did way yeah. better. They used the money better i think i think they i think mario brothers spent too much money on the on the goombas <laughs> they, they spent they spent so much money on the goombas they kind of run out of money when they came into their heads so they had to make yeah. they like only had like a couple of quid to make their head so yeah Odd. Odd, odd. Who would you have cast? Imagine there's no budget restraints. Who would be the best brothers, though? No offense to Scott Wolf and Co. Who would you think would be would good they at the time? Would have to be real brothers, or no? But they they should look a bit like brothers. No, yes, no. they have to be real bu- brothers, like the brothers in the film, Dylan. <laughs> oh, no, oh, yeah. Because well, okay, all right. So they don't have to be of the same ethnicity. Um, Do they actually have to? What age range are we going here for? Kind of, it can be like twenty mid twenties to early twenties, kind of, you know, that sort of twenties. Then twenties. Uh, <laughs> <20s. laughs> um, I don't know. Talking, uh, Jason Al Scott or... Lee. I'll be honest with you, I've never, I haven't really thought about this. I don't know who would actually be better than those two. Let's just say Scott Wolf and Mark Damas. <laughs> no, the, the, the Matthew Kaskas- Fox, and Scott Wolf. Yeah. No, I'm going to say Jason Scott Lee. Like he was in uh, the Jungle Book and Dragon the Bruce Lee story. Oh yeah, or and and Mark Descascos. 
No, sure, Freddie why not? Prince, no, Freddie oh. Prince Jr. Freddie Prince Jr. Oh, no, you... Freddie Prince Jr. was a complete unknown at this point, and I'm pretty sure he can't do Kung Fu. Would you just have two Freddie Prince Juniors and not bother him? <laughs> yes, like, like him double impact. Could you imagine? It'd be, like, be excruciating. <laughs> oh, but man, it would be entertaining. Oh, I'd watch it. Oh. Mm. Anyway, I mean, like, ideally, you would have made this in 1987 when. Uh, the game came out and had Keanu Reeves and Johnny Depp as the brothers. That would be hilarious. And in no way would they be anything like the brothers, but that would be pretty hilarious. I mean, like, in the game, didn't one of the brothers have blonde hair? Am I just making that up? Yeah, so it was just a palette swap. So, uh, same sprite, and then they just reversed the hair and the clothes. That was it. So one was, I think one was blondish, and the other one was a, a brunette. And... Uh, I would still keep Robert, uh, Robert Patrick in the same role, though. He was yes, good. Yes, yes, yes. And with his Andy Kernson therapy moustache, for sure. <laughs> Looks great. Uh, so, yeah, I think, like, uh, as you kind of come to a close of this episode, I have one question, that is, which film do we cover next? Because I've got to say, we've been doing this roughly, apart from Sonic the Hedgehog, obviously, roughly in chronological order. So, mm. you know what I recommend doing next? Mortal Kombat. Mortal yes. Kombat. Yeah, let's do it. Mortal Kombat Annihilation, the sequel. What, what, what two in one kind of thing? Yes. Are I'm they not on, doing a sip of Are they on? Are they on evil Amazon Prime or Netflix or something? I honestly have no idea, but we'll get hold of it somehow. Okay. All right. Okay. Mortal Kombat is yeah. Mortal Kombat is. Stay tuned. Hey. <laughs> Thanks for listening to today's podcast. We really hope you enjoyed it. If you want to get in touch regarding this week's episode or anything else, you can tweet us at Arcade Attack UK, at Keith Barlow82, and at Arcade underscore Adriano. We're also on Facebook at facebook.com slash Arcade Attack UK. Please check out our website at arcadeattack.co.uk for lots of retro gaming goodness, interviews, reviews, features, top tens, etc. And you can also find all our previous podcasts there. Our podcasts are available to stream from the website and are available to download for free from Stitcher, Podbean and iTunes, where you can also leave us a review and a rating, which we would really, really appreciate. So until next time, take care and we'll speak to you soon.